Good afternoon and welcome to the 23rd meeting in 2022 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. The first item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Wealth on the Scottish Landfill Tax Prescribed Landfill Site Activities, Amendment Order 2022. Mr Arthur is joined today by Robert Souter, Senior Tax Policy Advisor at the Scottish Government. I welcome both to the meeting and invite Mr Arthur to make a short opening statement. Mr Arthur. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon to the committee. The Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014 provides for Scottish ministers to prescribe specific landfill site activities with the effect that they will be treated as a taxable disposal, regardless of whether they meet the three conditions set out in Section 3 of the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014. These powers are exercised through the Landfill Tax Prescribed Landfill Site Activities Order 2014. The Scottish Landfill Tax Prescribed Landfill Site Activities Amendment Order 2022 provides additional confirmation regarding when a taxable disposal has been made and ensures that there is clarity for taxpayers and their customers. The Amendment Order amends the existing prescription for sell bonds to specify that the use of material to construct or maintain a sell wall is a taxable activity. And it provides that, in addition to the current list of prescribed activities, any other use of material in a landfill cell will be taxable, though with certain listed exceptions. Although additional landfill site activities are prescribed, the effect of the amendment order is to confirm what the Scottish Government consider to be the existing scope of the tax. It is intended to provide additional certainty for taxpayers and their customers. In order to minimise any potential period of uncertainty, as provided for in the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014, the amendment order was introduced using provisional affirmative procedure and took effect from 1st July 2022. The Scottish Government's view is that the amendment order also ensures that the scope of landfill tax in Scotland continues to be consistent with that in the rest of the UK. And on that note, convener, I'm happy to conclude and take any questions that the committee may have. OK, thank you very much. And I take it the latter is just to avoid what we would call a waste tourism. Would that be correct? There's obviously been a number of considerations that play into having that consistency um, with uh, the, the rest of the uh, UK. But yes, that is why, in terms of the way in which landfill tax operates, and indeed as the committee will be familiar with the setting of rates on landfill tax, Avoiding waste tourism has obviously been a key um, concern in taking these decisions. Okay. Um, can I ask you, the, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, said it would be helpful for the Scottish Government to provide a fuller explanation of the reason for the timing of the instrument. So I wonder if you can just help us with that. Certainly, and I, I would note that the, the DPLR committee in the report it accepted the, the, the reasons that we, we did provide. Um, fundamentally, we had consulted on this amendment order, uh, this proposal, um, in November and December of last year. We, as the committee would appreciate, took some time to consider the responses that we received via that consultation and also to engage in further discussion with stakeholders. There was any decision from the Upper Tribunal of Scotland that was uh, publicised in May of this year, and naturally we would have wanted to take further time to consider that as well. So, in effect, the first practicable date to make and lay the order was the 1st of July of this year. And it was felt that, given the need to provide certainty and clarity uh, to taxpayers and their customers, it would not have been appropriate to wait until after the summer recess had concluded. OK, thank you for that. Liz? Uh, thank you. Just on that same point, I, th I think we have uh, accepted that you know, there, there was a slight issue about the scrutiny, and um, you rightly have given the reasons for that. It does raise a slightly wider point, which I think is... Uh, something that the DPL has raised with other issues, that namely if, if there is a problem about the timescale because of recess or uh, other factors, it's, um, it's important that there is effective scrutiny. And I just wondered if you could just assure us that that issue will be dealt with by Scottish ministers generally, just about you know, the scrutiny aspect of these very technical things. 
No, absolutely, and I, I very much appreciate that point. Um, and obviously, it's only in, given the uh, sort of unique circumstances uh, pertaining to this amendment order we found ourselves laying it on the 1st of July. But absolutely, we are committed to um, ensuring that, where possible, we can provide maximum opportunity for Parliament to scrutinise all legislation. John? Uh, thanks, Convener. Yeah, I mean, on the same point, um, the DPLR committee, I know, has not been happy in the past and, uh, about the number of made affirmative procedures. I, I, I get it. There's an argument here for that. I mean, there's also been the suggestion we, can u we could use, Parliament could use an expedited procedure, which would uh, mean that um, it, it wouldn't be made affirmative. It would still be subject to Parliament, but Parliament would agree uh, to look at an issue more quickly. Than normal. Was that not an option in this case? Well, the options that were available to us were those set out in Section 6 of the Landfill Tax Scotland Act. And so what we did was consistent with the order making power within those provisions. As to uh, use more generally by ministers of um, provisional affirmative procedure, that would, I think, be a question more appropriately addressed to the Minister for Parliamentary Business in that case. But I would just reiterate the points I made to the convener. Um, it is, tends to be in very specific circumstances that we would only require to use the affirmative procedure, and it is one that we would only use where it is felt it is absolutely required to do so. Okay, well, I, th I thank you for that answer, but, convener, if I could just make the point, I mean, I think the COVID committee looked at this in quite a lot of depth, as well as the DPLR committee, and uh, I, th I think there is scope for the, this kind of expedited procedure so that committees would agree to take a bit less time and look at something more urgently if it is urgent, but I accept that's not always possible. OK, thank you for that, John. Any further questions from members of the committee? Uh, that's exhausted our questions, uh, uh, Minister. So um, we'll now move on to item two, um, which is um, formal consideration of the motion on the instrument. So I invite the Minister to move motion S6M05325 that the Finance and Public Administration Committee recommends that the Scottish Landfill Tax prescribed landfill site activities, Amendment Order 2022, be approved. Do members have any further comments? No. Minister? Moved. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S6M05325 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, so, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your time today. I now suspend for a brief changeover of witnesses.
Okay, so the next item on our agenda is our first pre-budget evidence session on Scotland's public finances in 2023-24, focusing primarily on the impact of the cost of living and public service reform. I welcome to the meeting Stephen Boyle, Auditor General for Scotland, Charlotte Barber, Vice President of the Chartered Institute of Taxation, and Susan Murray, Director at the David Hume Institute. And we're going to move straight to questions. So, uh, Stephen, first thing I'm going to ask you is that, that uh, in regard to your submission, uh, you said that the Scottish Government needs to plan how it manages the long-term sustainability of Social Security spending and be clearer how it will improve outcomes for Scottish people. Is this happening, uh, particularly with reference to how the National Strategy for Economic Transformation is helping to grow the economy? Good morning, convener. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, convener. Good afternoon, <laughs> committee. Uh, force of habit. Um, the committee will be familiar with that Audit Scotland published a report on Social Security Scotland um, earlier this year. And we noted that the Scottish Government, the agency Social Security Scotland, had made progress during a challenging period, particularly in light of the pandemic, and had continued to roll out devolved benefit arrangements in Scotland. Convener, you rightly highlight um, a couple of the conclusions on the report, though. One is about the um, long-term financial implications of the increasing um, benefit arrangements in Scotland, and also the divergence between Scotland's benefit arrangements compared to the rest of the UK. That that will, um, unless carefully managed, and we expect that it will be carefully managed, create fiscal pressures on the Scottish budget. Um, so we note that, and that is one of the recommendations in the report. Um, it's still being through evidence arrangements with other committees, so you know, we'll wait to see um, the outcome of that. Um, we also point, convener, I think, to the other uh, finding that, that you reference about the longer-term impact of devolved benefit arrangements um, in the country. Are they producing um, intended outcomes? And we recognise that it's still relatively early days in the rollout of benefits. Um, so I think, to answer your question directly, Convener, I think it's probably too soon to say that um, we can be confident, or the agency can be confident yet, on the impact of its uh, new spending and additional spending on developed benefits. And you didn't refer to the National Strategy for Economic Transformation in that response. I'm just wondering if you can touch on that. Probably not much further I can say in terms of whether that's actually happening mm -hmm. yet, Convener. We do have further work uh, planned on the continued rollout of benefit arrangements, but we haven't yet mapped the rollout to the, the National Strategy for Equity Transformation yet. It's something we can keep in mind for our further work programme. OK, thank you very much. And moving to you, Charlotte. I mean, people can obviously jump in if they wish to add anything, but when I, I have to say in terms of submissions, they're all quite distinct, so I don't think there's going to be a lot of overlap in the questioning from myself, but there might be one or two. So if you feel you wish to make a contribution, uh, I should have said earlier, please feel free to do so. But, but Charlotte, you say that you wish to draw attention uh, to dividend taxation in particular, uh, that this is set at a UK level as a and I quote, standing invitation to higher rate Scottish business income taxpayers to remain within lower UK tax rates by incorporating their businesses and paying corporation and dividend tax rather than Scottish earned income tax rates. So are you aware of what the current impact of this is in terms of revenue lost to Scotland? Uh, and uh, what is the potential for it to be a serious issue? I don't have precise figures about how much it does or doesn't happen, but in terms of, say, being a tax advisor, one of the key questions we'll always look at with a self-employed business is whether you should be unincorporated or incorporated. And that's always been the case whether you were advising in times gone by on UK taxes or more so now in terms of Scottish taxes. And it, a lot of the issue attaches to the question of national insurance. So perhaps if the national insurance rate goes down on Friday, that might or might not lessen the considerations. The issue, and I don't know if Susan might have information about the ways in which people work, which will also help to inform this, but the issue is around those who have their own businesses. HMRC work hard to stop people being artificially incorporated, uh, and it would be interesting to see where that goes, because I think there will be more focus on how people work and how they're taxed as time goes by with this new UK government. Uh, that's my sense of it. But at this immediate moment, I don't have precise numbers, but I do think 
it's very standard tax planning in a sole trader's business to decide whether to incorporate or not. And part of that decision is whether you're kind of rewarded in terms of the capital that goes into it from dividends or you're kind of rewarded for your actual work, which is Scottish taxes. Now, that has a tax consequence for the person who's paying taxes, and it has a slightly wider context in Scotland than it does south of the border, because south of the border, the issue would just be, are you getting income tax or corporation tax? Whereas here, it's a question of whether you have income tax and salaries or dividends are going into the UK, and, and presumably they flow black, back through the block grant adjustment, but that's not very visible, is it? No, it's not. I mean, I mean, I mean one of the said, things you've also said is that this is a, an obvious area to consider further devolution. I mean, whether or not that would be considered or not, but, uh, but by the, the UK government. But it's uncertain whether increasingly differential tax rates between Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK will reduce attract dividends to higher earners coming to Scotland. Now, this was talked about, you know, mm -hmm. years ago, yeah. as, as you'll be well aware. I'm just wondering what research has been done over the years about that, because I've seen research in, from other countries which have said that, you know, if there's a 2 or 3% differential, mm -hmm. it doesn't really make much difference to behaviour. You're not going to, you know, move everything um, yeah. all your, uh, because of a 2 or 3% difference. But if it's, you know, 6 7 8%, you might actually do that. So has there any research been done as to where the tipping point actually would, might be with regard to Scotland and the rest of the UK? I think a lot of the research that has been done on any of these kind of issues is that you can't really tell where the tipping point is until you've gone past it and it's a bit late to retrieve it. I think that's one of the mm. issues around all this. And I think there are also two issues here. One is for people who are located in Scotland, you might well not get up and move for sake of two, three percentage points or whatever it might be, uh, and of course the discrepancy gets wider the higher up the income scale yeah. you go, uh, but what you, where you might have your discrepancies are for those who might or might not come into Scotland and actually relocate here. Presumably if you're going to be a doctor in Newcastle or Edinburgh, it might influence your decision, say. Yes, I yeah, appreciate that. OK, uh, obviously I'll, I'll, I'll be asking another question. Mm -hmm. oh, Stephen, you want to come in on this issue? Yeah, yeah many thanks. Sure. Actually, just to uh, draw the committee's attention, this is a a, a, a regular feature of the conversation that the Public Audit Committee has in respect of the Scottish rate of income tax, that the work that the National Audit Office undertakes um, on, um, on the arrangements for the uh, income tax collection arrangements and the assurance that accompanies that, that Audit Scotland provides. Um, and I think really, as Charlotte says, that there's no strong evidence to suggest that taxpayer behaviour of Scottish taxpayers is being influenced strongly by the, the differential that exists between Scottish income tax rates and the rest of the UK. Um, one of the, the a features of the discussion that perhaps sticks in my mind is not so much about um, the, you know, whether people will, will move from, as you say, Edinburgh to Newcastle, but rather the identification of primary residence for, for those um, individuals who are able to you know, uh, choose which residence that might be. Um, mm -hmm. But if that's something of interest to the committee, we can share some of that material. I think it would be useful because I think it's the people who are the most mobile, who are also the people who pay the highest level of taxation or could be liable for the highest level of taxation that, that uh, is, is obviously of significant interest. Um, now, Susan, um, in terms of your submission, I'm intrigued that you mention open data and say that, and I quote, over 95% of data that could be open is still locked up at an annual cost to the Scottish economy of just over £2 billion. And I was struck by that size and scale of that figure. Now, I'm just, I mean, I took it that you meant the wider Scottish economy, not just the public sector, but if that's the case, what's the split? And how can or should this be opened up and over what time scale do you envisage that happening? So we wrote a, a document earlier this year with Open Data Scotland, who are the experts in this area, and what they did was analyse not just Scottish government data, but local authority data and work out um, uh, how much was locked up um, and how much uh, it couldn't, um, couldn't be got at. And the reason we, we came to work in, in this partnership was we were trying to map something and everyone had told me, oh, the data's there, it's really easy, just do it. So we managed to get a funder to 50% fund a post. Um, we got a WYSI data analyst in from CodeClan, they were amazing. And then we tried to um, collect the data of local government websites and realised it was all under copyright, which we were kind of a bit shocked by because uh, we weren't aware, we thought it would be under local government licences. So the further we got into that project, 
the more we realised it wasn't as easy and as simple as we thought it was going to be. And so we wrote that all up, and that's all on a, a data a website called GitHub. So we wrote the process there. We haven't been able to take that project further forward because the funding ran out. So everything's there for someone to pick up if they want to. But we formed this relationship with Open Data Scotland. And the more we learnt about how much data was locked up and people were beginning to try and monetize it, it was the opposite of what was going on in some other countries where they've opened everything up and said to people, here's the data, go play with it and see what you can do. And so that's leading to some really interesting innovation. So I think the case study in the um, briefing that I can forward up with the committee afterwards, if they like, is on the Helsinki region info share, which has got some really um, good things that have come out of opening up. But you can't always plan what people are going to do with your data. And I think that's the kind of... Um, so if once you put creative people in a room with data, they, they can do interesting things with it. So I think there's, there's data from, uh, from the pandemic when people were experimenting with... Um, websites and what was available, the use of the Scottish Land Register more than doubled in about six months, I think. And they were just, they, they hadn't been advertising it, it was just people started experimenting with what was on the web and, and seeing what was there, and more things have come out of that. It just seems a colossal sum of money, to be honest. And I mean, 95% being locked up also seems a very high percentage. I'm just wondering how you come to those figures and again the split between the private and public sectors on that. Yep, so it's all detailed in the paper. It's quite complicated so I can send that through afterwards. Given um, the amount of money involved and the pressure on our finances, I think it complicated yep. or not. I think it's something we have to look at, isn't it? Okay, I, I think so. I think it's 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 worth, it's definitely worth looking at. It's, it's something that um, this time last year, if you'd asked me about it, I, I was completely in the dark on how other countries were doing it and how we were doing it and how we'd written a strategy that said we were going to do it, but we're not quite doing it. So the Scottish Government website is covered by what's called an open government licence, um, but even within that, there's different portals that aren't as easy to access. And So it's, it is very complicated. I'm sorry I can't explain it in much more detail, but I can tell you who to call if you want to. Um, so Ian Watt of the um, Open Data Scotland is amazing on it, and that's who you wrote the paper with. They used to say, where there's muck, there's brass. Now it seems to be data. Um, things certainly have moved on uh, from when I work, lad. Stephen, uh, you reference Audit Scotland's report addressing uh, climate change in Scotland, which contains, and I quote, a high-level summary of key improvements needed across the public sector if Scotland is to reach its climate ambitions. Can you provide um, some examples of these and the cost and delivery timescale? Probably not in the detail, convener, that um, you would want this afternoon. And I think it's not that uh, there isn't ambition or uh, and clearly one of the government's priorities. But I think that the collective understanding of what it will take to deliver net zero is still evolving across the public sector. Um, our work is continuing in this area, actually. We, and we're thinking really carefully about you know, where we best um, position the public audit response in terms of climate ambitions. Um, our next item of work is going to look at some of the leadership and governance around net zero and climate ambitions and something that we'll be publishing next year. We know that public bodies have individually produced um, action plans. The extent to which those will be <clears throat> delivered really matters. There, there's openness, there's transparency about it and where they sit alongside other priorities, but probably not able to give you a precise uh, answer today, convener. You see, you're just teasing us, really, aren't you? You put these things in, you throw these fabulous quotes into these submissions, and I think, oh, that's great, I'm going to ask about that and see what it's going to mean for the 2023-24 budget. <coughs> and then you, you tell me, and I'm not trying to ask this, because this is the way that work is ongoing, as with yep. the previous question, work is ongoing. It's kind of a bit frustrating from a finance perspective when we're actually looking to you know, uh, make recommendations in terms of the 23-24 budget. So is there any possibility we would get any more meat on the bones uh, in the weeks ahead? Um, so not in terms of the timescales for the, the committee's budget scrutiny <coughs> for this year. Um, I think, if I may convene, I'd say that all public bodies, government itself, um, should have a clear expectation about their longer term financial planning and what that means for the delivery of their net zero obligations. So we would expect that that information will be available. 
it's consistent with some of the other comments that we've made in, in the submission that um, public bodies, government as well, need to have clear costed um, and uh, plans for the delivery of budget, whether it's efficiency savings or climate change obligations. Okay. Uh, Susan, in, in your submission you called for more spending on public transport. Um, can you specify how much more and what should be allocated to buses, ferries and rail? and where this funding uh, can be sourced from. So I saw that in the committee briefing. I'm not quite sure that was exact, my exact wording. Um, what we were saying was, um, if your priorities, uh, which were clearly stated, were to reduce child poverty and your net zero targets, then one of the things that would help for that is more public spending, um, more, more public transport spending. But there's got to be a, a, a give and take. You know, like where's, where's the money going to come from? And I think, there, at the moment, I think I have so many questions over exactly how much money there's going to be because we've got a big fiscal event on Friday. And, and I think it's really hard to answer questions to say what you're going to take money off of when you don't know quite how things are going to pan out and on what timescale changes might, might happen. Um, and even announcements that have already taken place, so I haven't... I don't know if I can say this, but I happened to bump into David Bell while I was waiting to come to committee. And I said to him, I don't quite understand. So the banker's bonus announcement has been bothering me because what does that mean for the fiscal framework? So if the average, if the, if the average median salary goes down, although, as David pointed out, salaries don't tend to go down, so, and, but the bonus goes up, does that mean that it's actually better, the banker's bonus thing, for fiscal framework than not and so this uh, yeah so so there's so many movable parts at the moment I, I don't know the exact amount to spend on public transport but I think I don't know the exact amount for anything at the moment because so much of it is moving and uh, and it just feels like how on earth you do scrutiny it is is up is, is really, really tricky. Well, that's what we're trying to grasp, and, that, and that's why we're relying on, obviously, yeah. witnesses. And so, that's why when so examples from other places in the world, they've done a nine-euro um, nine fare in, in, um, uh, in Germany, and that's had a phenomenal drive in the economy in terms of you know, people that have got money to spend have taken days out. Um, there's a great quote, and I think it's on a BBC article this morning, from an 80-year-old who's done a trip of a lifetime around Germany. You know, so... There are, there are things we could do with the kind of um, travel card that was available in COP26 that could make it easier for people to travel, but how, how is that going to work with encouraging people back into the office, which is obviously, you know, there's a push there, but at the moment some organisations have enabled free car parking spaces because they've got big car parks that aren't being used, so their staff are now driving to work when they used to get public transport. So there's so many things that are moving at the moment, that are happening in different ways to what they used to. It's really, really, really tricky. You know, and people, some people are still reluctant to use the buses because they feel it gives more chance of catching things. So there's, there's so much going on, okay. I think. So if you can't put pounds, shillings and pence on it or, or anything of that nature, what areas should be transport pr be prioritised over? Because, um, I mean, at the best, I think, we can envisage would be a, a static budget. You know, probably declining in real terms, but probably st maybe static in cash terms, maybe slightly higher in cash terms. So we have to prioritise. So if you're saying that we should spend more on public transport, and the reason I'm asking you that is because you specifically said it in yeah. your submission, what should it be prioritised over? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really tricky question because everything in there, and if you look at all the submissions you've got, everyone wants their area to be spent on. You know, there's, there's no one saying don't spend on, on anything. Um, what we're trying to do is look across the piece and say, if these are your priorities, then prioritising the, the child payment, the net zero targets and the um, health and social care spending meet the priorities that have been set in the budget, which is what the question was that you, you asked, do these priorities? And we, we kind of think they, they do, but what are you going to deprioritise? And the, the things that were announced last week in the revised budget, if that's the right term, in the spending announcements, you know, it's difficult to see at the moment what detail is, you know, there are big numbers of what might be cut, but actually what programmes will be cut is, is tricky to know. So, you know, when we were looking at the numbers, there's 
there is support there to help people claim additional benefits you know so the uptake of pension credit is really really low you know i think the committee's talked about that before down at 40 percent you know if you could get more people to take up that then that would be a good use of money you know because then they might not be claiming something else and you know so there's everything seems to have got a balance you know, because it's going to go up and down depending on what your intervention is Okay, Charlotte, straightforward question, I think, for you, <laughs> uh, which is uh, at current um, levels of wage increase, um, assuming no change in higher tax thresholds in Scotland, uh, how many more Scottish taxpayers will be caught in fiscal drag from next April? Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I'm, despite liking tax uh, and being a tax advisor, I'm not necessarily that g'd up on wages and where wages will go but obviously if you set your thresholds and you don't increase them then there's quite significant fiscal drag and I think all the surveys and research that's been done recently that I've been looking at says you know the more there's inflation the more the more there'll be fiscal drag I you also read other things that question that because the inflation's coming through food and petrol and, and energy and I'm not sure whether wages are keeping up with that. I don't know if you've been doing work on that, Susan. But uh, yeah, I don't think they are. I mean I think it's quite clear that they're not. But if wages are not keeping up to the same extent, then clearly you, you know you're not going to have wages going up and therefore taking in more tax, are you? Uh, well, I mean, if, even if, if inflation is 10 per cent and wages mm. go up 7 per cent on average, yep. that's still going to take a huge chunk that of people will take into quite higher a few. taxes yes. and then they'll be liable with that. So that extra pay increase they may get, a more a higher proportion of it is going to be therefore taken in taxes. Absolutely. And the reason I'm asking for this is because obviously that, although that will be not particularly welcomed by the people for whom that impacts mm -hmm. upon, for the Scottish Government it will mean additional revenue for yes. all the... A plethora of organisations who understandably want additional funding, mm -hmm. given this, the, the, where we are at the moment. So that's why I was kind of trying to ask that. Uh, well, I think generally, fiscal drag and freezing allowances doesn't tend to feel as painful to people as actually saying you're putting something up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 but that comes to political presentation, doesn't it? And I think that's often an easier one. But of course, the other thing we have to look at are the moving parts. And I'm going to echo what Susan says. We don't know where we'll sit for what might or might not be announced on Friday. And, you know, you could measure fiscal drag per se here now. But mixed in with that is the balance of how people view things, isn't it, vis-a-vis -vis south of the border? Okay. and where they might be and whether the personal allowance is put up or this is put up or because of course the personal allowance is the one that most affects Scottish income tax and who actually pays it in the first place. Okay uh, final question to yourself um, Susan which is um, you, you talked about barriers to work need to be removed which specific barriers do you think um, need to be removed as a priority? Can I add something to the last one first? Of course you can. So I don't know if you've um, noticed, so ONS stats um, that came out last week, um, they had a number of over 65s returning to work, um, which is the first time they've seen that um, in fairly significant numbers. So that's um, generally part time, um, but for over 65s, almost supplementing pensions. I think that's an interesting phenomenon um you know is it going to continue and i think one of the things we've not touched on yet is behavior in terms of tax you know we've talked a bit about fiscal drag but the cost of living crisis <coughs> impacting on how people do they want to go and earn more money and they might um but also um the other ons number that came out was um the largest increase in employment rate um it was one of scotland was one of the places so you know that they, they're good signs um Sorry, I've forgotten the question now. I've that. Uh, well, the, the question basically was about the barriers. You're suggesting the barriers. barriers being so, removed. And asking um, what barriers should be so removed. One of the, the biggest barriers is um, people with someone disabled in their, their household. Um, being a carer is, is a really big barrier. Um, there was a report, I'm going to get the name of it, out earlier this year that I was just reading this morning, um, about how... Uh, people, the effectiveness of the support around an individual that was maybe furthest from the workplace. And although the 
take up had been lower, the effectiveness of the port had been um, deemed to be really, uh, um, really good, and it had, had long-term consequences for those households. So, um, I think those those are good signs. If we can get people that are farthest from the workplace back into work, um, but with a package of support around them, then that's got to be good long-term. Okay, thank you. And Stephen, my last question to you is: uh, I was astonished to read that there, are, and I quote. Over 40 different financial outputs published by 10 government departments or public bodies. So how can these be rationalised uh, and made more transparent and what savings might ensue? So there's a, a report convener that the committee may be familiar with, the, the Scottish Exchequer um, Department within the Scottish Government produced a discovery report that looked at the, some of the publication arrangements and touched on some of the, your earlier interest in and open data uh, and transparency. That, that's a good start. We would say it's important that there is, I think, a recognition of the scale of the, the challenge that exists. Um, Timescales for this, we know, is that it will be 2025 before the government uh, has set out how it intends to uh, rationalise and move to a, a clearer set of financial documentation, open data. We hope that we go along alongside that. Timescales for that. I can imagine that the committee will be interested in, in that, that, whether that's moving at a pace that, that you would want to rationalise it. You'll be familiar, convener, that for many years we've called for greater transparency, particularly during the pandemic, between uh, spending announcements, budgets, and then reported financial information. The, the pandemic itself was a, an event where the traditional budget setting arrangements and financial reporting didn't lend itself to spending that covers across multiple departments within government. Um, we think there are other live examples. Cost of living may very well be one itself, as with climate change and the government's other priorities, child poverty, will all require spending across a number of different departments uh, to move towards this. Um, that's as much as we know at the moment, convener, that in terms of where the government is progressing. So welcome the recognition um, and planned improvements. Um, and keen to see uh, progress uh, on this front. I mean, I recall in a, in a previous life, the McClelland report, in which we talked about rationalising IT across Scotland. Does that not really happened at all? It doesn't seem to have from, from this. If even financial reporting has got 40 different outputs, I mean, I could imagine there were a few, but possibly, annoyingly, but 40? I mean... So if, if I, would, I would just add, if I may, so, so looking at the... One of the key features of the resource spending review was on, you know, the, with the fiscal environment that the um, country is in, will require efficiency savings, and that these um, will, will need to be costed with clear timescales and, and responsibilities um, around them. Alongside the committee's other interest in public sector reform, is that that has to be done in a way that is clear and transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the impact is also known, the anticipated outcomes are clearly set out for, for users of public services and for public bodies themselves as well. Um, so I think you know, whether it's referencing learning, learning from McClelland's report or from the recent review that's been undertaken, um, there is something of a pace required convener to, to support public and parliamentary understanding of, of the decisions and the changes that are coming. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and to generate savings, which I, I know no one seems to be putting any pounds, shillings and pence on anything today, I notice. But uh, the last question uh, uh, from myself before we open it to colleagues uh, around the table is to yourself, uh, Charlotte, and it's a very straightforward one. Uh, in your submission, you call for the devolved taxes legislation working group to be reconvened as soon as possible. So who should chair it? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, uh, it the last time it met, it was convened by the clerk of the predecessor committee, and that worked well. Uh, and I guess it's a decision that perhaps need made between yourselves and the Scottish Government, because there were equal num members of the Scottish Government this, due to support from this committee uh, and external representatives in that devolved taxes legislative working group. And uh, if, uh, stepping to the side a moment, uh, I was involved in the Welsh Finance Committee's deliberation on a similar kind of exercise, and it's actually quite a tricky question. So I think it probably would best be served with political leadership. 
but likely also the minister, perhaps, do you think? Yes, yourself. I, I must admit, I hadn't kind of given it specific thought as to who I would nominate as chair, so there's off the top of my head. The reason I asked it is because it was in your submission, so I thought I'd take it. Yes, I, I think uh, the, the group worked really well before. It's one of the most interesting groups I've been involved in, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a really difficult, tricky kind of issue, but I think it's really important because, well, for a number of reasons, I, I don't think it's appropriate. The professional bodies don't think it's appropriate for... <coughs> primary legislation, your tax law, to be changed using secondary legislation. And everybody always responds by saying, well, we've got that already for the rates increases, decreases. And rates, I think, are slightly different because you can see if it's 10% or 11%. I mean, it's crystal clear. You pay more or you pay less. But anything else actually imposes upon the citizen. And I think that's part of your requirements around accountability and it's why tax has devolved and, and so changing that should be done after due deliberation and I think too with secondary legislation you know most of the regulations that come in here I'm sure you probably look at them and think well I can see the sense of it but I might try and improve it of course you can't because it's all or nothing around secondary legislation uh, and, and I think that that doesn't help get it as good as it can be and that was one of our kind of things that we wanted, wasn't it, when Scottish tax first came into place, was be fleet of foot and make it fit for purpose and all those kind of phrases. So I think having that devolved taxes legislative working group back, it worked well. There was a lot of interesting debate. And I think it's time to move it on. And even if you didn't use the finance bill I was waiting for you to mention those two words, finance and bill. Yes, well, there you go. I got them in. <laughs> uh, do you want me to say them again? The, no, I'm sure others will ask <laughs> And a that. tax committee, that you could have that too. Uh, no, but, uh, but if you had something like a regular process that came through this committee more visibly, I think it would help to inform people about their taxes. Okay. And that's a part of what we want to do in a budget. It's not just what you spend, but how you get the money to spend it and how much you get to spend it. Well, thank you very much um, uh, for uh, answering my opening questions. I'm now going to uh, allow colleagues in from around the table. And the first to ask questions will be Deputy Convener Daniel to be followed by John. Thank you very much. I just add, uh, I think that the committee will be delighted that you, you arrived at the right answer by suggesting that he should uh, convene that body. Um, uh, I, I, I'm sort of, in a sense, approach uh, the budget and decisions we have very much uh, you know, with my old small business, uh, uh, you know, owners had. And, and, and looking at it, I think we can look at all sorts of things in terms of the complexity, but actually a lot of it boils down to brass tacks of what, what, what's the expenditure from the government, what's, what's optional, what's not, what's fixed, what's variable. Uh, you know, and looking at the, the submission from, from Audit Scotland, I mean, one thing is, is very clear, with, uh, with payroll at £22 billion, pounds, the, 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 the headcount that the Scottish Government is carrying, both you know, directly and also indirectly, is its single biggest cost. Indeed, it contrasts with some of the other things which are mentioned, both in submissions from the bodies in front of us and others, of a billion pounds of procurement or £1.5 billion of procurement in NHS. But that's small beer compared to that. So I'm just wondering what you, uh, you, your Stephen Boyle's thoughts are about what, what um, the government's options are regarding headcount. And crit critically, <clears throat> the statement in your submission saying that it's assuming that, 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 that the workforce will continue to grow mm -hmm. at 1% a year through MTFS, now that stands, in, to my mind, in contrast to statements the government have made about reducing headcount to pre-COVID level. So I was just wondering, what, what handles does the government have on its headcount uh, uh, and, and where, where do you think the government's thinking is in terms of how it manages its headcount over the, the, the coming years? Uh, good afternoon, Mr Johnson. There's, you're right in terms of our submission. You know, we do highlight that the pay bill is collectively the single largest uh, item of expenditure. It's hugely significant, even in, in terms of other items of uh, large expenditure within the Scottish budget. We note and we draw reference to the medium-term financial strategy that talks about you know, the, the pay award, 2% and a 1% growth across the workforce. If that varies by it's a 3% pay award and 2.5% growth, it results in a further £1.3 billion of expenditure by 2026-27. Um, if there is a, a steady or flat 
um, pay bill for the Scottish public sector. And given the level of pay awards that are being discussed, some are settled and some not yet with uh, public sector workers, inevitably that would mean a reduction in the headcount of the Scottish public sector workforce. Some of that um, um, can be done through you know, natural wastage, uh, people retired, jobs not backfilled and so forth. Um, but coordinating that perhaps alongside or, or the government's other plans for public sector reform, what that might mean so that it's done in a coordinated, transparent way um, is the, the basis of our submission to the committee. We'd also note that um, this won't necessarily all be done on a, on a cost reduction basis. Um, in any organisation, particularly with the um, level of worker rights and protections that exist, is that there may be uh, cost or money have to be spent, incentives given to public sector workers in the short term to lead to longer term reductions. But it's important, I think, I think the point I would emphasise the most, that it's not just done on a piecemeal basis, that this is actually coordinated and fully connected to service delivery requirements, expectations, what outcomes are still anticipated um, from government spending that is alongside the priorities uh, and full and proper connections to the national outcomes at the same time. So I think your managing finances is complicated and indeed I'm going to come on to the, the 40 uh, financial uh, reports uh, shortly but I would suggest that managing people is even more complicated and difficult uh, you and, and if you know I think that that, that, that you're sort of hinting at that uh, three percent pay growth which is the assumption is uh, I think that's the the uh, higher scenario that's in the MTFS I think that has been superseded somewhat, even by most recent pay awards of, of around 5%. Um, so can I clarify, I mean, are, are you saying that the, the, the working assumption of government is that, that essentially the payroll bill will remain fixed and therefore that, that it's going to have to manage uh, the, the, the headcount accordingly? And then secondly, are there the systems and processes in place to enable them to do that? Because I, my, my fear is I think this is being implied uh, in it, or stated in broad terms but but you know actually without this sort of the detailed work behind the scenes it could lead to some quite brutal outcomes for people working in the public sector yeah. taking your questions in turn i um we are drawing our submission on the medium-term financial strategy so um that clearly was of a time when inflation assumptions weren't uh, as they're now running at and what that might mean for pay awards as Colleagues have mentioned with the fiscal event at the end of the week and then the government, Scottish Government's intention to hold their own budget arrangements very shortly thereafter perhaps will give an opportunity for their response and, and more clarity of what that might mean for the public sector pay bill. So I don't have any further insight into the government's uh, assumptions about uh, the pay bill other than drawing on reference to the medium term financial strategy and the resource spending review which clearly sets out an expectation for some parts of uh, public sector service that there will be cash and real terms cuts and in some sectors that, that will be people led it can't be anything other than it. so if there's not going to be an increase in the pay bill and they're still meeting um, pay award expectations it's difficult to see other than that will mean a reduction in headcount for public sector workers i think it's also safe to say that given the, the uk government's intention to reduce their civil service numbers to um, pre-COVID and pre-Brexit numbers, inevitably that will have a consequence for the devolved governments across the UK for what that means for, for their settlement. Um, it is the case, and you know, Charlotte rightly referenced, it's not just about spending, there could be in, you know, tax choices about what might mean to support that. But I suppose we look to set out in our submission that if there are a reduction in headcount, that will need to be really carefully managed, not on a, on a piecemeal basis, that there is oversight within government, clear and detailed workforce planning that um, goes across sector and service delivery given the interconnected nature of public sector service delivery. Indeed, I, mean, I think there's some very big questions posed by that and I think it goes way beyond the, the, the remit of, of just this committee. Um, but but sort of just moving on slightly, I mean again, you know, given the complexity of what will need to be done and will need to be managed, the ability to track what is actually being spent against what has been 
pledged in the, in the budget is critical. Again, that comes back to my you know, experience in small business. Now, I guess my question is, and, I, and I've, I've, I've posed it before, but let me pose it again, is, is, um, is one thing about the lack of clarity we have on the public record, but to what extent are there the systems internally for the Scottish Government to be able to do that? Because I think there are, those are two distinct questions, and, and while one is frustrating for us, and I think there's public accountability issues, I think there's, there's actually delivery issues of whether if, if those systems and processes are not in place within the government to track their spend against what has been budgeted for. I mean, so are, are those systems in place in your view? So um, I'll hesitate to give you blanket assurance um, on that because I haven't done any recent audit work on the government's systems uh, for tracking the delivery of headcount. So this is with reference to a number of years ago when I wasn't uh, involved in the day-to-day -day audit of the Scottish Government and did see progress about their arrangements around workforce planning and the quality of management information improved. But uh, forgive me, I don't have that kind of current up-to-date uh, insight into how that's operating. Um, I will, of course, speak to colleagues and see if we can uh, support the committee with further detail around that. Um, and we can also, and we are thinking about quite carefully um, over the next few months about what this means for audit work in terms of the government's priorities uh, through fiscal sustainability for public sector workforce um, in the country. Um, but to go back to your direct question, I, I'm probably not able to give you the, the detail of answer you're looking for this afternoon. Thank you very much. I'll just pitch one last question to both Susan and Charlotte. And I'm, I'm interested both by your written submissions, what you've been saying uh, th this afternoon about things like public transport and I think impacts on tax. Uh, you know, and again, we've already had reference that the unemployment rate in Scotland. Of, of course, what that, the detail sort of missing from some of that is that we still have lower labour market participation, participation rates in Scotland amongst both younger people and older people. And, and so the question is this, is do you think there's sufficient thinking in, in policy terms about actually the linkages between what programmes the government undertakes and its impacts on tax receipts, i.e. given that we are now much more dependent on income tax growth, you know, are, is there sufficient joined up policy making to actually look at how we both get more people into the labour market and also grow wages for those that are already within it? And, and I'm wondering if that was sort of lay, lay at the heart of the public transport question and indeed the, the, the helping people uh, back into work question that the, the, the uh, David Hume Institute rose in the in the written submission. So maybe we'll go to Susan first and then Charlotte. Um, I have to say I've not audited or, or whatever the correct word is um, every single policy the Scottish government doing. In, as an outsider, um, I see I see elements of joined upness. So I see the. Um, the kind of Scotland is now campaign, you know, attracting people to come and work in Scotland. I don't know if you remember the, the London Underground, um, Scotland's a better quality of life, come live here, that seemed to have um, fairly good results for a while, I think, from the numbers that I remember. Um, I think there seems to be, um, there seems to be concerted effort, I think, to help people back into the labour market. Um, and I think the report, I think it was fair... It wasn't fair work. It's got another name, the report, but it sounds like fair work that I was reading this morning. It seemed like it had been fairly successful in terms of the interventions that have been taken. But I do note that in the budget cuts last week that were being like, employment support was one of the things labelled. So I don't know what's going to be cut and what's going to be there in future. Um, but I think you know, we do have a demographic problem and we know we need to grow our tax base. So that has to be constantly watched. And I think regular tracking of the, the data coming in to see who's joining or who's leaving the labour market is really, really important. Sure, the same question to you. Does the government sort of think of tax as money in and spend as money out and not make the link that uh, might be between the two? Uh, well, I've, let me start by saying I've spent all my working life trying to encourage people to think about tax uh, with perhaps a modicum of success, I don't know. Uh, but one of the reasons that we really would like the Devolved Taxes Working Group put back in place and to bring a kind of annual fiscal discussion to bear uh, and, and in here more widely so than this budget review, because a lot of this budget review 
to my way of thinking, tends to be spending focused. I think if you brought that tax more to life and you had more debate around it and more consideration of it, that in itself would help it filter through better to being joined up between tax and spend. Uh, John to be followed by Ross. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, well, there's been a lot so far, so I'm going to try and build on some of that. Uh, and the first one which the uh, Convener raised, which I was also interested in, was this idea of d data being locked up. And I just wondered if you could maybe expand on that a little bit more. Could, could you give us an example of data that's not available, and if it was available, how it would help uh, the economy or whatever? Um, so the one, that, the one that we were working with as the project that bought it brought the whole paper together, was we were trying to map um, all the community um, infrastructure across the country. So things like village halls, places that people could come together. Um, and what we found out is if we looked at uh, uh, the local government websites, you couldn't um, scrape, is the technical term, you couldn't scrape that data off there um, legally. Um, because it's all copyrighted um, on, on most of the websites. Um, Sorry, just on that point, yeah. the, the existence of a community hall is copyrighted? No, only if you get that data off the local government website. If you get it from Google, it's not. Right. So you can get it from Google, but you don't know if it's accurate. But right. you don't actually know if the data on the local government website is accurate or not. So, so there was a whole data um, issue that we were looking at, which was just like, it just, I have to say, blew my mind that local government uh, text on their websites was copyrighted, whereas if the text on the Scottish government website is an open government licence so anyone can use it or quote it, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that's a tiny thing and it doesn't give you the monetization of it. Um, but what we were trying to do is if someone in their local community was wanting to do something, what's the easiest way for them to find out about where they could do that and and how do you we were actually looking at how do we unpick SIMD data in the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation because what we were worried about was generalizations in that data meaning that funders were making choices about where um, money was going and it might not actually correlate with the resources that were available to those communities so what we were trying to do was map data to see if the communities that were um, lowest in the SIMD had the lowest number of resources and, and unpick that. Um, and it was really difficult to do. I, I'm still trying to get my head around this. <laughs> I'll give it another go. Um, so if that information about community centres and such like yep. was more available, uh -huh. um, what, what like more maybe more community organisations would be set up or, or would be able to... It, it, it could be. I mean, there could be an economic benefit, but I think the thing about open data is you don't control what someone's going to do with it. So I don't decide, oh, so-and-so needs that village hall data because they want to do X. You make it available and then things mm. happen, but you might not necessarily know what that thing might, might happen is. And that's the tricky thing about open data, I think. So in the Helsinki region case study, which is in the, the paper that I'll, I'll send to the committee afterwards, they didn't know what was going to happen when they made the data about the region available. And I think that's the... That's the really interesting thing about data, you know, and the, the more technical data analysts I speak to is, you know, when you put these amazing people in the room and their brains come together, they go off at tangents that you mm -hmm. couldn't imagine from the start. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, they can drive the economy, but not if you lock it down because then they'll come up against barriers and mm -hmm. that's where the problems come. I mean, I'm absolutely on for the data being available, I just, so, so would you say the £2 billion pounds is quite a rough figure? Um, I can tell you how it was calculated um, in an email. I'll have to follow up afterwards, oh, but right. I can't off the top of my head remember how it was calculated. Yes. But I, I, when Ian did it, I was like, that's massive. We've got to double check that. So we double checked it and then we triple checked it before we put it in the paper. But I, I can't remember off the top of my head how we, how we did okay, the calculation. Well, I'll leave it at that. Colleagues okay. may want to follow up and that would be helpful to get a, okay. an email, I think. Thank you. Um, moving on, Audit Scotland, uh, in your submission, you talk about the fiscal framework being intended to incentivise the Scottish Government. The Scottish economy is doing well, tax revenues increase. Scottish economy is not doing so well, uh, revenues don't increase. I mean, would you be prepared to say, or do you think that actually the fiscal framework is weighted against Scotland at the moment? 
um, th that's not a position of view that we've reached. And um, I think as the committee know that the fiscal framework is under review. So yes. I'm inclined to leave that to experts who are in the midst of that review um, and, and read their conclusions with interest. Okay. Uh, well, unless anyone else wants to come in on that one. D does anyone else want to come in on that one? No? Okay, right. Okay, I'll get that one. Realise that kind of sensitive issue, I suppose. Um, the Chartered Institute, uh, and we've already mentioned the interaction between maybe income tax and corporation tax, because people would incorporate. But in fact, in your paper, you also mention various other taxes as well being in there, um, like capital gains tax and national insurance. And there's a whole kind of package in there. Now, um, if that if more of these were to be um, devolved, presumably we could come up with a more joined up system. I was, I was reading a Reform Scotland paper recently, I think mm -hmm. it was June, that was published about tax, which was quite interesting. So, I mean, would the, would the argument of the Ch Chartered Institute be that it should be kind of a bit more neutral, so that if somebody incorporated it, it shouldn't actually make any difference, uh, because they wouldn't, or, you know, if you put your profits into shares and it's capital gains tax, I think some countries do this, that all the taxes are kind of the same rate on any kind of income. I think that what the Chartered Institute of Tax is looking for is, I mean, I realise this is wishful thinking, but as simple as possible. Yes. And obviously you want to collect as much money as you can without enormous pain points or things that drive behaviours. And so... You want consistency, you want forward planning, you want it to be as simple as you can. Uh, and one of the things that I think we find interesting with the devolution of income tax is that obviously once you've devolved income tax rates and bans, then you have the option of changing them. And if you change them, then you've differentials. And once you've got differentials, there is more scope to say, do you know, will you go down this route or down that route? So it's those kind of considerations that need to go in the mix to get something, because tax shouldn't be your kind of foremost driver, should it? No, I, I, absolutely. Um, and, I mean, an, another, uh, maybe linked in with that, uh, the David Hume Institute, you talk about the size of the envelope and growing the tax base. Um, and are you thinking also widely or... Is that mainly like income-based taxes, or are you thinking land-based taxes or different taxes as well? Um, in that comment, we were thinking about the um, em employment-based taxes that we've got at the moment. And, you know, how do we um, stop the demographic effects that we're going to have on the workforce and the ageing you know, issues that we're going to have going forward? So how do we keep the labour market strong and thriving in Scotland? Right, could you expand on that a little bit more? When you say size of the envelope, what envelope actually So means? the amount of tax that people pay in terms of employment taxes is what we were thinking primarily in that, mm. that sense. Right. Your biggest source of funding is income tax. So yes. obviously if you want more income tax or more tax, full stop, income tax is your primary source to look to. And you probably get more tax by having more taxpayers and more highly paid taxpayers. So that's really how you would increase the envelope with the powers that you have. But are we too dependent on income taxes? Uh, the, the package is what it is. I mean, and we can best kind of say wh how it works. Uh, I don't think I would comment on whether you're too dependent on one or the other. I mean, the big taxes are income tax, national insurance and VAT. They're the real ones that bring in the money. OK. And... Your paper also uh, mentions council tax, and clearly that mm. has not been reviewed, or it has been reviewed, but it's not been changed for a long time. Are, are you a little bit critical that we haven't changed or replaced council tax? It, I don't think we're critical or not critical. I think council tax is one of the levers that you have, and it is one that is more within your powers than, say, income tax, because it sits more separately, and it's also completely within Holyrood powers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the argument, that, or the, the main reason that's put forward for it not having been replaced is that nobody can agree on what should replace it. That's not an area you would go into as to what would be a good property tax or a good land tax or anything like that? I don't think I'm going to commit myself to that here. 
That's okay. Sorry. Enough. Would the David Hume Institute have a view on that? Um, I think it's an area that seems to have been looked at quite a lot over the years, um, and the fact that people still haven't agreed and nothing's changed, um, it, it surely shows something's going on with it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it seems like everyone agrees it needs to change, but no one will agree what needs to change. Can we not just stop wasting time and get on and make a decision? Um, would be my that's my personal philosophy. I don't think David Hume's written a paper saying that, but geez, come on, you know, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I could pursue that one. I'll, I'll maybe just leave that uh, where but it is. But at the moment, I can also say you've got a cost of living crisis, so that's that's front of mind, and anything that is going to take time and energy away from dealing with what's going on at the moment is, is going to not get it either. You know, it, it, there's such a balancing act to be done with your time at the moment. Okay. And um, you also say in your paper there's little evidence that cutting income tax will boost economic growth. Yeah, I think some people might be surprised at that. Might be surprised that we wrote it down? or um... Um, Well, the, 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 there is little evidence, because we do hear arguments from some quarters that uh, cutting income tax is a good idea and will boost the economy, but you're saying there's not much evidence for that? Um, we haven't seen much evidence um, I think Paul Johnson was on um, BBC Radio Scotland this morning um, talking about um, tax cuts almost never pay for themselves, I think was a quote, and there were some several, several other um, interesting comments he made this morning. I think, you know, the IFS are pretty up on all this stuff. If, if they're worried about tax cuts, then I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting sign. I didn't hear that. I'll go back and read it afterwards. Thanks very much. Thanks, Camille. Thank you very much, uh, Ross. Before by Liz. Uh, thanks, Camille. Sticking with tax and just going back a moment to John's line of question there on council tax. Um, Charlotte, as, as John said, your submission mentions the uh, process that's in the Butte House Agreement between my party and the government around reform of council tax. The, the objective of that process is to replace council tax, mm -hmm. but what we're looking at at the moment as a committee is the, the coming financial year, obviously we're not going to replace council tax in time for 23-24. Mm -hmm. yes. There are interim changes that can be made to the system as it currently is, the factor that's used for uh, calculating the rates could be changed, reliefs could be altered, removed entirely, new reliefs could be brought in. Uh, does the Institute have any views on what changes could be made to council tax as it currently exists? I don't think there are specific a list of wishes as to what should be changed. I think, as Susan has just said, there, there's been some really robust studies around council tax not so long ago, and it's a tax that raises a lot of money, uh, and how do you replace that? I mean, one of the reasons that it's got its pain points is that it, you know, some people find it expensive. Uh, and so it's, it's actually a difficult one to replace because it does collect a lot of tax without a lot of problems in terms of collection. I mean, there might be problems in, in perception. But there, uh, and so it's actually a really difficult one to reform. But I think where the CIOT is, stands is that this is actually a tax that with, is within Hollywood powers mm. and therefore it's easier to work with and... You know, the, there's the proposition that, that one could pick it up and work with it. Did you take a view on the time or, or since then about the, the minor changes that were made around 2018 to essentially increase council tax for, I think it was band F and above? Was, did you come to a view at that point on whether that was effective, whether it met reasonable objectives? Let me come back to you on that one, yes, because I think the Low Income Tax Reform Group perhaps had comments and I'll pick that one up and come back to you on it. Thanks very much. There was another point in your submission that I thought was interesting around the government's review of the additional dwelling supplement and you were essentially urging for, for progress to be made mm -hmm. on that. So again, similar line of, of question. Uh, do you have a, a view on what would be a desirable outcome? Do you want a lower rate of additional dwelling, a, a higher rate, something else entirely? Let, let me come back to you on two, po two points in relation to that. First off, I think you'll tend to find that the professional bodies, Chartered Institute Tax and others, don't tend to comment on the yeah. rates. Uh, do, do you know, we can discuss rates in that, you know, if you put it up to 40%, you say it's expensive, you get anti-avoidance, you know, avoidance kind of measures. But broadly speaking, whether it's 3 4 or 5%, we wouldn't comment on. That's a political decision about how much money you take out of it. I think where the issues sit with additional dwelling supplement are much more with how the tax works. And I know that the previous committee had a session on this. It doesn't affect lots and lots of people, but those it does affect, it affects really 
very invasively, very strongly. And I think it's been on the table for quite a while that there are some issues around additional dwelling supplement. And the, there's been this kind of call for evidence about them. And, do you know, again, what's the point in, in having that within your remit if you can't pick it up and do something with it? Which is why I think we would like to see it being taken up and dealt with. Thanks, Susan. Your uh, submission as well mentions housing as, as a key priority, and it specifically does mention targeted action on second homes. Does the additional dwelling supplement factor into that? Does the David Hume Institute think there's more that can be done there? Um, we didn't look at that, so I don't have any information on that. We did look at, for a previous um, uh, response we did for the Scottish Government on something, we looked at um, short-term let provision and some of the work that's been done on that, and um, the the interplay between that and the small business bonus scheme and I think there's some really interesting data on that which is is worth looking at um, so I mean I'm sure the committee knows this already but 86% um, of self catering properties uh, get the relief um, and a, a number of them receive 100% relief and when you look at um, the Airbnb listings there's um, a number that have got over 100 properties and you just think some of those are, are really pretty big businesses and some of so we were we were trying to work out how the different areas of policy play together and and you know where things are crossovering and might be encouraging something you might not want and housing just keeps coming up as a as an issue when we speak to people on on different elements of different issues across Scotland, you know, young young people wanting to stay in communities, not able to find houses, workers trying to recruit and not able to find their employees, it comes up again and again. So, I think how how that works out across Scotland is is a really tricky issue. Your the housing section of your paper was particularly interesting. You also mentioned, um, I, I presume, because it was uh, written well ahead of this programme for government, you mentioned uh, potential greater use of rent pressure zones to, to affect positive policy change there. The PFG, two weeks ago now, obviously in, uh, announced a, a freeze on rents and a, an evictions ban, and there's a long-term commitment towards introduction of, of rent controls. Is that the direction of travel that you were trying to hint towards and saying that more could be done with rent pressure zones? Do you think what was announced in the PFG will achieve some of the objectives that you were looking for there, or were you indicating something, something else? It's really difficult to tell without the detail of exactly how those all, all work. Mm. You know, there have been... Um, pros and uh, cons of different schemes in different places around the world. So I think it, it, the devil's in the, the detail on, on that, I think. Um, what, I, what I do know is when we were trying to recruit um, a, someone that was actually a Kickstarter to our team, um, they just couldn't find anywhere to live in Edinburgh. And I've heard that story over yeah. again and again. And, um, you know, they've, they've moved somewhere else now and we've managed to work with them remotely. So we've, we've kept that that role but you know I'm not the only employer that has you know, struggled to support a young person to stay in Edinburgh. I'm sure many MSPs would empathise with that trying to attract parliamentary staff to work mm -hmm. from this building. Um, the, just one final question for, for everyone if anybody's got a, a particular view um, on it. There's been a lot of discussion at the moment around and in fact I think it's playing out on Twitter and in, in newspaper columns today around what more action the Scottish Government could be taking right now to help people through the, the cost of living crisis and there, there seems to be a, a tension there, a, a misunderstanding perhaps around what can be done in future financial years, particularly around tax for example. I think there's another column in a newspaper today saying the Scottish Government should be increasing income tax immediately on, on higher earners to pay for free school meals, something along those lines. Obviously the Scotland Act says we can't do that, we can only, if, if that decision was made it can only be made from, from the 1st of April onwards. Is the discussion that is currently taking place around in-year revisions to the Scottish budget, do you think it is sufficiently in informed? Uh, is, is our public sphere currently having a, a substantive debate or are we still in a place where people are coming at it from completely different levels of understanding of, of what the current fiscal arrangements actually allow for and what they don't? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to go first? Uh, yeah. One of our hobby yeah. horses is that people don't understand enough about the taxes and I think you see that right across the UK. Deloitte did a really interesting survey back in 2019 which looked at that. They also looked at whether compliance would go up if you understood it. Yes, it does. Uh, and I think, as I was saying earlier on, if you put in an extra layer of devolved taxes, automatically adds the complications. So uh, automatically it makes it more difficult. 
things like can you make in-year changes? No, you can't. Uh, that's probably not understood. Mm -hmm. Who goes into that kind of detail? Things, the other thing that I think is poorly understood here is that tax is one part of it and the fiscal framework with the block grant adjustments is another really significant part of it and, and, and those kind of moving bits. No, I don't think they're properly understood, but maybe a finance bill would help it. Or is that bad of me? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, Steve, you know that you were looking yeah. to come in there. Thanks, Mr Groove. Just very briefly, and probably at risk of repeating points that I've made to the committee uh, before about... Um, but firstly, positively welcome the summer budget revision arrangements that were brought into place um, during the earlier stages of the pandemic as an, as an additional mechanism to support transparency. Without getting into kind of, uh, the detail of the powers of, of the Act that, that allows um, the Scottish Parliament to, to implement, um, I would, at risk of repeating that thing, it says that effectively the arrangements don't really lend themselves to you know, significant, whether it's crisis events or um, areas of public spending that require cross-departmental um, responses. So just looking at the, um, the original budget through to uh, in-year spending announcements, through to financial reporting, it probably comes from a much more stable era, whether it's pandemic, cost of living or climate change, that um, feels like now is that the appropriate time to have a really close look at that to support public parliamentary scrutiny and transparency. Thanks. Susan, do you have anything to add to us? No, I'm really aware I'm sitting next to Charlotte, and although she's here with her Charleston Institute of Taxation hat on, um, I remember reading a paper that you wrote for ICAS, um, and it was all about tax for the common good and what would happen if more people understood it, and I think that was a really good paper that I think we should probably visit again. Thank you. I'll look that up. Thank you very much. That's all for me, Camille. OK, thank you. Liz, to be followed by Douglas. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms Barber, just to continue that point you've raised about um, public understanding of tax and uh, willingness, I think economists call it a good tax, which is, and nobody likes paying tax, but it's a good tax when people do understand it and recognise what benefits it's going to produce and they know how it's being spent. Um, and that follows on from the last question the convener asked you about this, uh, if the devolved working party group was to be re-established, mm -hmm. Would you advise that we kept the remit of that group the same as it was the last time, or would you like to see the remit expanded to try to help with this business about understanding tax? That's a, an interesting question. I think the remit should stay as it is, because actually the, the remit of that devolved taxes working group is quite tricky as to how you get a legislative process that fits in with kind of the desire, perhaps sometimes with taxes, to make very quick changes. Mm. Having just said you can't make them immediately, but you know what I mean, if you were looking to anti-avoidance measures or something like that, uh, or, you know, the ADS report comes through and you wanted to change it, if you wanted to do it quickly. So, so you've got that, but you also want time to kind of properly consider things through stage one, two, three and bring it through mm -hmm. into legislation. So there's those kind of conundrums. You also have to have it fitting in if you're going to have a regular process with how the legislative process fits in with the cycles for budgeting and, and, and tying the two together. And the reason I think that that devolved tax legislative working group didn't come up with final propositions was that it's really... It needs a bit of careful thought, and I think it should fulfil that remit. And if it did that, then one could always build on it by saying, that's a great job, could you now consider this? Interesting. And, and you, you mentioned in your report that you had uh, noted the cross-party suggestions that we might have a finance bill. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how you think, if it did happen, a finance bill process, how that would articulate um, with uh, the... Uh, devolved tax group? I mean, do you see them working together or do you see them as entirely separate? That devolved taxes legislative group was, well, it wasn't a one-off because it lasted for quite a while and it had a, a great number of meetings and then it did an interim report. But I, my understanding of that group was that it was set up to put forward propositions as to how you could get a better legislative process. And, uh, I mean, a part of that is why would you want a better legislative process? Because, again, you know, some people say that the sec secondary legislation is OK. Uh, so uh, I think if it delivered a final report, it would then need to come into yourselves 
and the government to agree on what process you did or didn't want uh, in order to kind of take these things forward? Uh, again, interesting uh, answer because uh, Audit Scotland quite, quite rightly has been uh, suggesting that we have to improve the scrutiny in this parliament mm -hmm. and greater transparency over um, well, a whole lot of things, but particularly uh, tax and spend. Uh -huh. And I, I'm just wondering if, if the devolved tax group did its job properly mm -hmm. and its report came in, let's say, to this committee yeah. and then... Um, went to the Scottish Government. It doesn't necessarily compel it to be part of uh, a chamber process, as in stages one, two and three. Whereas if there was a finance bill, that would compel that. And I'm just interested as to whether you think we need them both together or uh, whether uh, we could operate uh, with uh, a separate... Uh, my understanding of the devolved taxes legislative group was that there were kind of a number of propositions put forward and part of it sits around whether you think that changing tax are technical changes do you know something like the ads for instance if we were to change that plenty of people would call that a technical change i personally would not because i think any change to taxes has an impact on a taxpayer and therefore it's a policy change about how much somebody's going to pay or the penalties are levied or that kind of thing. So I don't actually agree that you get such a thing as a technical change and I think that should be parked and that's why I think I would favour a finance bill because then you can put all those changes through it. Why would I want something like a finance bill because I think it needs a regular slot and one of the issues that the devolved taxes legislative working group is, faces or, or yourselves face is at the moment what we're looking at is primarily around the fully devolved taxes land and buildings transaction tax and the landfill tax aggregates when it gets here that they're not you know, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about income tax being your big money spinner. They're not the biggest money spinners, but they do set the tone for your taxes here. And again, depending on what happens in the foreseeable future, now's as good a time as any to set up your processes for when you might or might not have other taxes, say. Uh, and that's why I think you might bring a finance bill in now. All of you might say you've plenty on your plates, and actually we don't want a finance bill every year because we've other things to think about, and the changes that are going through would either be small or this kind of technical, which is often a euphemism for, oh, heck, I don't understand it. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not accusing any of you being in that position, but the, you know, the technical changes do take a wee bit of thinking through. Or do you know, if we went back to something like the ADS review, uh, and Mr Greer, your questions were interesting. I don't think they make a, a huge change to the second homes market. What I do think some of the proposed recommendations might do is make a change to the fairness and the sense of perception of fairness around additional dwelling supplement because there's not many that are badly affected by it. Badly affected is maybe caught up in, 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 in a way you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be caught up those people must think it's hugely unfair and that, I think, taints your tax rather than being really important in terms of money. So those are the kind of reasons that I think you would maybe want a finance bill is to bring it in here, have a full discussion. If you do a stage one discussion of a, a bill, you tease these things out and, and then hopefully they get more mileage and air coverage. Uh, th that's extremely helpful. Thank you very much for these comments. I, I'm personally persuaded of the need for a finance bill because I think it does enhance uh, scrutiny and I think it helps um, people to understand a bit more about um, where their money is actually uh, going to be spent and I think that's crucial. Could I just ask the Auditor General if you felt, I mean you've said a lot through uh, Audit Scotland about enhancing uh, transparency and uh, scrutiny, I is it your opinion that the finance bill is something that should be uh, looked at? I probably haven't nailed that down yet, Ms Smith, actually, but if, if it supports the overriding objectives of improving transparency, supporting parliamentary scrutiny, particularly in the volatile environment that we've been in and, and anticipate that we'll remain so, um, then we would, in general terms, be in favour if that's one of the mechanisms. It may not be the only one, I think, to say, but if, it, if that uh, acts as a, an additional lever for the parliament, then we'd be keen to have support that and have further conversations about how it may best work. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Liz. Uh, Douglas was followed by Michelle. Thanks. Thanks um, Stephen, you, you mentioned earlier, and it says in your report, 
um, you know, structural reform in the public sector can take time to achieve and generate short-term costs. And we also have the, the government, you know, in terms of looking at the public sector pay bill, their desire to keep that at a, a sort of constant level. So do you see any urgency from the, the Scottish Government to bring forward proposals? Because I, I would imagine the longer they leave it, the, the more cutting they're going to have to make. Do you see that urgency coming through? Or you know, has there been any discussions with the government yet on when these proposals are going to come forward? Um, so we're not aware of any detail yet. I think that we obviously, like the committee and others, will have read that it's the government's intention to progress with public sector reform. Um, as set out in the, the resource spending review in light of the, the scale of financial challenges. Public sector reform, you know, of course, it can be structural. It can be, as, the, as is mentioned in the paper, that it's a move towards you know, digitalisation, different ways of delivering uh, public sector services. So we've not been involved in any of those uh, conversations. I think nonetheless, so whether, you know, if there's urgency or otherwise, there is uncertainty that, that's being created. Um, and very clearly from our own thinking and submission is that regardless of whatever structure is a policy decision, you know, not for, for us to, to, to comment on, that the intended outcomes are clear, the costs are clear, it's transparent, it's set out as to what is intended to be delivered. The, the risk, of course, is with the scale of change that takes place, that tracking and monitoring the whether it's additional costs or savings becomes harder, most particularly whether that's not just spread over different government portfolios, but if it goes wider than that across different parts of the public sector, that becomes harder for uh, parliamentarians to scrutinise, for the public to be clear on the intended benefits. All of those things would need to be set out in advance. Also on that, the impact on, on services and the impact on people that it may affect because there's been a change. I think, I mean, looking at the, the scale of the fiscal challenges are clear. Um, so there's inevitably that there'll have to be um, challenging decisions that will be made across the public sector to uh, deliver financial balance. Um, but ultimately, users of public services will want to be clear, have an, uh, an anticipation of what that will mean for them. Um, so it's not just cuts we're talking about, whether it's restructuring or reorganisation. All of that has to be done in a, in a transparent way both the spending that takes place to deliver those uh, transformations uh, and at the same time, uh, ultimately, again, you know, what it means for, for public users. And, and I guess just now there is, uh, you know, when we look at digitisation, if we look at like local government, for example, there, there must be a patchwork out there of, I would imagine, some local authorities have digitised and transformed quite a lot already. So, you know, maybe, maybe some of that savings might not be there that the government may think there could be. Would that be right? Or... Um, so I'll, I'll be careful, you, you know, Mr. Lumsden, that I'm not, uh, uh, I don't audit local government um, in Scotland. My colleagues in the Accounts Commission uh, do so, but I, I appreciate you have a, a, a further panel today. I did read with interest the scale of innovation and change that has already taken place. So I think before embarking upon any assumptions about what digitalisation will deliver, I think the government and others will want to be clear about what's already been achieved. Yeah, some of that work hasn't been done yet, but that, would, as you say, would have to be done before they embark on any programme, I guess. Any cost, any plans you know, would, uh, for transformation and digital or otherwise to be costed, timescales clear, who's responsible, all of that to be reported publicly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the other question I had was around, you know, we mentioned divergence on um, uh, benefits earlier, but, you know, another huge divergence we have that we're seeing is on, on growth and, and tax income. You know, do you feel that the Scottish Government are doing enough to understand the reasons of that divergence between the rest of the UK? And are they, are they, have they got pl you know, plans in place that you can see to try and tackle that divergence? And we want to have a go at that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start, but I suspect Charlotte knows more about it than I do. Um, I think the, the only point, of, just to re repeat the reference I made earlier on, actually, that um, the National Audit Office um, and ourselves do look at the Scotland's income tax arrangements um, and to understand where there are differences and divergences looking at taxpayer behaviour. But this will be you know, it's undertaken on the government's half, behalf in Scotland by HMRC um, through you know, regular discussion and dialogue. But uh, again, I'm more than happy to share that material with the committee, but I suspect Charlotte is better placed to respond. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether I am because, I, you know, in the main, what we would look at is, is primarily the individual and the operational side of tax. So uh, that's probably where our expertise sits primarily. Uh, and in terms of 
divergence and what sits underneath it. I mean, that's all about how the different moving parts between fiscal framework, economic policy, taxes sit. You know, reconciliations of you know 870 million. Something is going wrong somewhere. We would we would think. I wouldn't like to comment on that for sure. It doesn't look sensible, does it? Uh, do you know, just looking at it cold. But then you've got different people making forecasts, uh, and, and you've to marry those up, and you come back and you revisit them. And it's do you know, it's not an exact science, is it? Predicting exactly how many taxpayers you're going to have. Things can only be worse in recent times with people working or not working. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and that all comes back to things about why one needs a better understanding and more conversations about how taxes do work. Okay. Thank you, Kimbira. Thank you very much, Douglas. Michelle? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming along today. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Auditor General, a question. First of all, you touched on it briefly, uh, but in your submission, you note that the resource spending review notes 129 public bodies in Scotland, and you quite coyly comment that structural reform can take time to achieve and generate short-term costs. And, and I note the point you make as well about service delivery and outcomes. However, you know, so in, in terms of our typical time cost quality of any change, what you haven't kind of given any indication are the potential for cost savings. So my question to you is, of the 129 public bodies from an audit perspective, how does that compare with other countries? And I realise this is a very difficult question, but by head of population or some other appropriate measure. In other words, have we got far too many and we should actually have less and accepting what you said earlier? Yeah, it's a, a, it's a difficult question to give you a, a precise answer. There, were, um, there are... There, there are jurisdictions elsewhere in the world that will have far more public bodies than that, and there are others that will have less. Um, I think from our perspective, and, and you'll know that <clears throat> it's not my role to comment on the, the merits of individual structures or, or policy, is about the, are, are the outcomes clear from what individual public bodies uh, are being asked to do matters more than the structural um, the, for the delivery of public services. Um, if I may, a slightly related point, actually, just to note that um, with the challenges that are, that are clear in the, in the fiscal environment, that if there are um, structural changes proposed, these can take time. And you know, they may not deliver the intended outcomes at the pace with, to address some of the, the challenges that are clear. Clearly, the, you know, if managed properly, there may be longer term savings, benefits. Um, but it might not deliver uh, what's intended uh, in the short term. To go back to your original point, um, if a committee would find it helpful, it's something we can look at uh, and come back to you uh, with any information that we hold about the relative uh, number of public bodies per head of population, um, and I'm happy to do that. That would be very helpful, because I know you will carefully qualify any data you put across. Uh, just kind of following on from that, um, in terms of outcomes and that focus on outcomes, are you aware of any overlap of outcomes that might lend to consideration of streamlining from, a, from an audit perspective? Or perhaps I should ask, when was the last time that you kind of audited the, audited the effectiveness across the board of the 129 bodies? Um, so all 129 public bodies are audited every year. So they are... Um, subject to annual public reporting through the bodies themselves, all of the audit judgments that uh, are available on our website through the annual audit reports. So um, I know the committee are familiar with, but happy to state for the record that the public um, audit model in Scotland goes beyond just a review of the financial statements. Auditors also look at um, the extent to which financial management is operating properly, the financial sustainability and also the value for money that public bodies are delivering. So that's, that's all clear and available. Um, yes, there is overlap, of mm -hmm. course, between the delivery of, of public services. Um, if referenced in the national performance framework and the national outcomes, it takes many public bodies to deliver individual uh, outcomes. So um, some, call, some would say overlap, others say that's, that's necessary. It's partnership working to deliver effective public services. And given the 
the overarching nature of some of the priorities. Now, the delivery of um, child poverty being one can't just be tasked with one individual organisation. Many, many public bodies will have a role uh, on that. Um, and probably then maybe step back slightly to say, does that mean there should be structural change and have one body? Um, or is it about improving how these bodies are working together along with improvements in transparency of how uh, public services are delivered that contribute towards the national outcomes? I think that really that's the question that the government and the parliament you know, will be grappling with. Thank you. My, my, my last question about that uh, goes back to your point about potentially the, the immediacy of the crises that we are lurching from, because we've had several, you know, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, we've got a cost of living crisis. Do they actually, uh, plus the upfront costs that you clearly point out before you get the benefits, if they are benefits in financial terms, uh, do you think that works to inhibit the kind of structural change, and you use that term, uh, you know, does short termism always win the day? Or is it is the possibility increased that short termism always wins the day? I don't think it's one or the other, if I'm being frank, actually. Yeah. But in inevitably, there's always, you know, challenges of the day, but that shouldn't push out longer term planning, both policy and, and financial. Um, and I think it's that I suppose given the experience that we've gone through over the uh, over the course um, of the pandemic and what's been a really reactive you know, requirement mm -hmm. just by, by necessity um, and much of the, the thinking that government and other public bodies are doing is that um, not just recovery about reform actually to move to a, a more sustainable model the committee will be familiar, you know, Audit Scotland has published reports for many years talked about the unsustainable nature of some aspects of public services, we've said that about the NHS, and we did a paper earlier this year about social care, about there, there are immediate pressures that need to be addressed, but they have to manage them alongside longer term thinking and planning for the delivery of public services. I appreciate it. It's difficult. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to move on to uh, another area. It was uh, a comment that you made, Susan, I agreed with strongly about there's great potential for using procurement as a tool to drive change. And I wondered, I mean, you do make some, like a broad suggestion in your submission, but can you give us a wee bit more flavour by what your thinking is in, in here? You simply mentioned standard environmental and social policy criteria, but could you give us a few more examples? Because it, this does interest me. Well, one of the examples we looked at, I'm just looking for my notes on the numbers. Um, we looked at whether or not um, there were additional employment criteria put into some of the contracts and the number of jobs that have been created um, in certain categories. Hang on while I look for my notes. Um, it's in there somewhere. Um, but we thought, um, yeah, so 92% um, of suppliers pay the living wage. And my question was, like, hmm, why only 92%? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but given the total size of the budget, creating 146 brand new jobs, 27, 27 apprenticeships and 31 work pla placements with 453 qualifications, that seemed really low as a percentage of the whole of the number of procurement contracts. You know, you think you would think there would be new jobs. Is it just mm -hmm. people transferring as a contract transfers and they're too paid over and they're not new jobs or, you know, and and we were just we were just looking at, you know, there's a lot said about community benefit clauses and additional sort of criteria that could be put in, but we just weren't sure from the, the reports that we looked at that those criteria were actually being used. And there, I think there's more potential to use those criteria from the numbers that we looked at. And it was the Scottish Government Annual Procurement Report 2020, 2021 that we looked at for those numbers. And arguably then, perhaps what you're suggesting is more um, transparency and making that linkage again to various outcomes. I don't know if you want to come in on that point, Auditor General, it just strikes me as an interesting area. Just to agree with the premise of the question, absolutely. That yeah. there is you know, clearer um, connections between spending and outcomes. Yeah. Okay. My last question was that, uh, and it's something both uh, yourself, Auditor General Susan, you've mentioned around the kind of the net zero targets. Um, I mean, this is already very, very difficult to do. We, we know that, but 
Where will the tipping point occur as we anticipate a fiscal event from the UK government? And if reports are correct, it could roll back some of the commitments to net zero. Where's the tipping point and how that increases the challenge for the Scottish government when they have such a clear target to try and uh, achieve that? And I mean, obviously, you mentioned, Susan, in your submission, uh, is the acorn carbon capture and storage that I think really everybody I've spoken to was utterly gobsmacked that it didn't come to Scotland. But I suppose I'm trying to kind of flesh out what would what would happen to make you really concerned about this? This has really just made Scotland's job so much harder. So from both of your perspectives. Um, so we, we will bow to the superior knowledge of the um, Climate Change Committee because I think their reports are fantastic, really well researched and they, they just know their stuff. Um, for me, I think it, when the, the cost of living crisis is the immediate thing in everyone's mind at the moment, but we've spoken about the long-term objectives and we've got to not lose sight of them. And I think there's been a lot said in the media about the, the energy price cap and how that might... Um, disincentivise you know, energy efficiency measures because people are sort of, oh, I don't need to do that. And when you look at what's going on in the UK compared with Germany, they're stopping lighting all their public buildings. They've turned down their street lamps. You know, they're, they're really going massively on, on conserving energy. Um, we've not really talked about that, but the, the um, knock-on effect of the, the, the states doing that in Germany is that individuals are also conserving more. And I think, you know, if, if we can't get people to conserve more and, and use less, you know, we don't accelerate, um, you know, war homes and insulation and all, all the things we can do to reduce energy use, um, it, there's going to be really, really big, big problems. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have anything to add to that? Really very briefly, um, I think clearly about prioritisation mm. um, as the extent to and which climate change remains a priority, and it is, as set out in the, the resource spending review, um, to be managed alongside other pressures, available public spending resource, taxation choices at the same time, and, and, good, and, the, and the conversation we've just finished about doing all of that as a short-term priority against medium-term um, planning at the same time. All of that is difficult, absolutely, but, but very necessary that that's done. Um, to, you know, to influence individuals' behaviour, the public bodies themselves are clear about you know, what's priorities. They can also think about what this means for their delivery of service. And I suppose one thing we um, haven't touched on this afternoon is about the public sector estate is huge in mm. Scotland. There will need to be really considerable thinking, planning about what um, public buildings um, and what they're for actually, whether they're owned and used by public sector bodies or whether there's individual community benefit that can ensue from them as well. All of these are the choices that are facing um, government and public bodies over the months ahead. I think it's going to be interesting. Thank you, Kavira. OK, thank you very much, Michelle. And that concludes our deliberations with regard to our first panel. So I'd like to thank each of our witnesses for coming along and answering our questions. Uh, I'm now going to call a break until 20 past four when we'll reconvene with our second panel.
We will now continue our pre-budget evidence taking on Scotland's public finances in 2023-24. And I welcome to the meeting Councillor Katie Hagman, Resources Spokesperson at COSLA. Kirsty Flanagan, Chair of the Seek for our Local Government Directors of Finance Scotland section, who is attending remotely, and Paul Manning, Executive Director of Finance and Corporate Resources and Deputy Chief Executive, South Lanarkshire Council. As with the previous panel, we will move straight to questions, and I therefore like to begin by uh, asking uh, the first uh, few questions. So, in terms of uh, Cosler's submission, I, I have to say it's excellent, it's very detailed, and I find the uh, appendix is particularly useful. However, the thrust appears to be that additional funding uh, for local government is required, although all indications are that the settlement that the Scottish Government will receive will be static in cash terms or de and, and decrease in real terms. So in your submission, you highlight an anticipated 743 million reduction in core funding by 26-27. If that's not to come from local government, uh, can ask where should it come from? Uh, other areas of the Scottish budget? I mean, you've touched, for example, on health and social care. Um, or do you envisage the additional powers over planning and building control fees and tourist tax, which you suggest should be um, um, provided to local government, uh, filling that gap? Thank you, convener. Um, nice easy one to start, yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And thank you for, for giving me the time to speak today to the committee. So what I would say is there are going to be difficult decisions and certainly from a local government point of view, we would look to looking at a whole system approach to finance. Um, it is undoubtedly, as you say, going to be challenging to everybody and difficult decisions will be made. Um, the impact on the flat cash settlement to local government is going to be challenging for local authorities to say the least. In terms of where additional funding comes from, I would I would dearly love to be able to, to give you a response to that. Um, but certainly from the cause of resources point of view, you know, my, my role here is to highlight that you know there has been really challenging decisions and there has been um, a lot of of financial cuts that have been made already within <coughs> local government. We would look to having a whole systems approach and certainly you know, an aspect that has been discussed is around flexibilities and about making you know, hard choices. I would also perhaps go on to say that we need to work in partnership with local <coughs> government and you know, Scottish government and certainly looking at the priorities that government is making it would be local government that is potentially going to be delivering a, an awful lot of those. So we do need to have those open and transparent discussions about working together in a much more collaborative way and almost on trust that local government can deliver those key priorities for, for Scottish government. Okay, well, thank you uh, for that. I mean, obviously, the issue we face in the Finance Committee is that everyone who gives evidence to suggest they should have more money for their particular area. So we're always asking, well, you know, how can it be funded? Because it's either additional taxation or it's from other sections of the budget. And it's, all, it's helpful when people can actually suggest that money spent on A is, is more effective in terms of public pound than B. Now, you, when you talked about, for example, whole systems approach, you know, and you, and you did say in your, in your um, submission, I quote, a more collaborative approach to budget setting. How do you foresee this actually working practically? I mean, do you are you suggesting that the Scottish budget should somehow work with um, with the, the uh, with COSLA or whoever to actually sit to, to, when it creates its budgets, or do you think it should come at a later stage in the budget process? How, how do you see this working? So in terms of discussions with COSLA, I think it's really important that we do have that open dialogue. And certainly it wouldn't be for, for COSLA to you know, mandate that funding needs to be cut from various places, etc. But we do need to have that open discussion. And you know, one of the points that has been brought up around flexibilities 
is we also need to be in a position where there's not necessarily blame apportioned to perhaps local government or to Scottish government if perhaps some policies aren't able to be achieved because of the severe financial constraints that local government may be under in future budgets. So it, again, it's about having that collaborative talk and about being able to be open and honest without blame game, because what we will find, and it's certainly something that's come up already, is what works for one local authority isn't necessarily going to work for all local authorities. And this is one of the reasons why we need to have that flexibility and being able to sort of trust local government and being able to deliver on that. But I'll maybe ask if Kirsty wants to add into that from a more sort of detailed point of view. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Can, can you hear me, convener? Yes, I can. I'm sure we all can. Yep. Yeah. Thanks very much. No, I just want to say thanks very much, convener, to allow me to, to uh, join you totally. It saves me a, a seven-hour plus uh, journey. So, on, on collaborative approach, I think there, there's numerous examples of announcements that were made uh, prior to any engagement with uh, COSLA uh, and uh, local government that then transpired that the costs were significantly uh, more than what were originally estimated. And a good example of that would be free school meals. And that's why we would we would welcome early engagement uh, with local government and COSLA uh, uh, when uh, policies are being are, are being developed. Uh, can I can I pick up on your your previous question uh, as well? And, and Councillor Hagman mentioned that the whole system approach. And, and you know, there money there, there is extra money in the resource spending review that's going into health and social security. But I think we need to recognise that. Uh, that local government play a key role, and uh, particularly in prevention. And in, if by putting that money uh, 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 downstream, you're, you're, you're probably not getting the saving you could get if you kind of invest in the prevention. And that's where uh, local government uh, could help. I also think that uh, uh, I've just lost my train of thought there. I also think there's quite a lot of new policy commitments. I welcome that in the programme for government there doesn't seem to be too many new ones, but off late there's been quite a lot of new policy commitments, and I think we need to focus on what is the priority and looking at the core budget rather than continually bringing in new policy commitments all the time. Okay, thanks very much. I just want to follow up what you just said a minute ago, basically, because in your submission you said, and I quote, the Scottish Government is continuing to focus funding in areas where things have already gone wrong in people's lives, rather than providing funding to stop them going wrong in the first place, without evaluating the impact on other areas. So is, it, is what you're suggesting is that, first of all, there should be an evaluation before the Scottish Government increases its, its uh, expenditure in these areas and what would you say to people who say well you know folk who are actually struggling and need these the, the, the money now actually and some of the kind of solutions that suggested going through local government are perhaps a bit more longer term than the folk who would otherwise receive these benefits um, would, 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 would wish for it, it's a difficult balance because yeah, people are needing uh, needing the help now but if we don't uh, try and move away from um, from tackling what the urgent issue is and move to prevention, simply, so, you know, so, so it's, it's a difficult issue. Yeah, I mean, you've said again, and I want to quote your own um, your own submission. You said that, uh, and I quote: "There needs to be frank discussions about what should be deprioritised in the public sector. So, what should be deprioritised?" I don't know if I could answer that one fully, because obviously it will depend on uh, local authorities, what they might want to uh, uh, deliver locally, locally. But there is a lot of funding that is directed, and, uh, and we don't have the local uh, autonomy to make uh, our own decisions. So uh, it, it's difficult for me, as I say, to comment on 32 authorities, <coughs> what needs to be done. Give, uh, give us an example of one. Sorry, give us an example of one then. One thing that should be deprioritised across the vast area of local government expenditure across 32 local authorities, because this is this is obvious, if this is of fundamental importance, then there should be examples. If we're going to put together a report making recommendations to the Scottish government on deprioritisation, it would really help if we had at least one example of where deprioritisation should take place. 
Well, we've seen a significant increase in early learning and childcare, uh, and uh, you know it's a significant amount of funding uh, towards that. And uh, as costs escalate, the, the core budget has been uh, has been uh, eroded uh, from that policy decision. So, you know, whilst it's commendable uh, to have the 1140 hours, you know, there maybe needs to be uh, consider whether the scale of that uh, was right. There's I, I hate to mention, but there's a national care service. Uh, I think you probably knew that would come up in, in some discussion, and that's a, a huge area of reform that is going to cost a significant amount of money uh, uh, on the set-up costs as well as the running costs of the, the national care service. So, uh, uh, again, that's that's an area that that could be looked at. Thanks. That's that's very helpful. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Manning. Just in case you feel a bit neglected, I was going to ask you about. Uh, well, I've got a number of things I was going to ask you about, but one of the things I was asking, going to ask you about is national care services. Submission from Causa says it poses a risk to council's ability to deliver a wide range of services for communities. Is that something South Lanarkshire agrees with, and, and what services and in what way? Again, I suppose this is something that was picked up uh, within our own submission. I suppose part, part of what informed that is that it comes from a backdrop, I believe, that currently there's a, a, a level of service provision that's underfunded. Right? There, there isn't enough money within the system in terms of care, and I think that's acknowledged. Uh, the risk that we have is that we're embarking on a major structural change, and I'm not convinced we fully understand how much this is going to cost. So, for example, uh, there have been figures quoted of around two-thirds of a billion pounds. Causeless suggested a figure nigh on double that, at 1.2 billion pounds. So there's a significant amount of risk in this. One of the points that I think the Causeless submission makes, and our own local authority submission makes as well, is if there is going to be additional funding uh, directed towards social care, and I think there's a consensus that there should be is there merit in doing that within the context of the existing structure? Right? Could a better outcome be achieved more quickly by doing it within those existing structures as opposed to creating an entirely new structure of a national care service and everything that's required to, to service that? OK, so you're answer, asking the question. Can you give us the answer to that, then? It's almost a rhetorical question you're given, but I'm keen for you to say how it would um, be beneficial if, it, if you retained it within the current structure. A, a, a properly funded system right, could deliver a better outcome. And that's working on the premise that part of the reason that the care system fails is because of underfunding. Right? So, you know, if, it, if, if an appropriate amount of money was directed towards care services through the current structure, and that's not to say that no reform is appropriate. I'm sure there is a degree of reform that's appropriate within this. But does it really necessitate uh, the creation of a completely new national structure right, in order to deliver that? One of, the, one of the other concerns that I think the, the Cosler response in our own picks up on as well, uh, you know, as well as not fully understanding those costs, part of that aspect around the residual impact on councils, uh, you know, in, in terms of what's left, right, particularly for smaller councils, if, if we take you know, what probably amounts to a third right, of the average council's expenditure and remove it from the remit of local authority, around things like support services that are left, do they still have the critical mass right, to support those councils? It is a, 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 an absolutely fundamental change. There are things as well that haven't even been dealt with right, uh, around the national care service, particularly from a finance point of view. So how, how is VAT going to work? We know there have been problems in the past with major, major structural change within uh, the, the local government family around VAT. The assets, right, so currently those assets are the property of, of councils. So how, how is that going to change? How is that going to change in the intervening period? And also things like pensions, which are acknowledged in the, the consultation papers that have been put out thus far. You know, we're talking about a workforce of 75,000 people and there's a real vagueness about how the pension arrangements are going to be dealt with. So there's a whole number of things there that could undermine local government's 
ability to deliver services. So, for example, if this critical mass that you talk about um, was reduced significantly in some of the smaller councils, and if you look at Ayrshire, where I'm an MSP for North Ayrshire, there's three Ayrshire councils which were actually created for political purposes rather than for any other reason. Um, does that mean that the three might effectively would be in a better position to merge into one local authority because they wouldn't be, uh, be viable anymore? Or would the same situation be in Forth Valley with Falkirk, Stirling and Clackmannish? I mean, where would we be if this situation um, progresses, as you suggest, in terms of uh, being able to deliver support services? So, uh, it's, it's a really good point. Where, where would we be? Right? And part of the apprehension around this is that by taking the step towards this change around the National Care Service, it does start to trigger further reforms. It will necessitate further reforms. So if, if you've got a smaller council, if you think about things like you know, financing, payroll, legal services, HR, internal audit, right, and, you, and you take a third of what you do away from that council, right, the critical mass within those functions may not exist anymore. And where that domino effect probably takes you next is a discussion about wider reform. So. Uh, I suppose what I'm saying is you, you could be looking at a period of five or six years right, of significant public sector reform, which is necessitated by this change. Right? And across that period of time, you do run the risk of people concentrating on reforming their bodies and reforming how services are provided right, at the expense of actually delivering for communities. OK, thanks very much. That's very helpful. Um, now, back to yourself, um, uh, Katie, you said in your submission that, uh, and I quote, from a human rights perspective, there's a duty to increase resources to achieve the further realisation of rights. So what are these uh, specific rights and how much resource um, would be required to realise them? Um, I don't have a whereabouts in the, in the submission is that quoted from? I'd have to look through it all because okay. what I did was I read the whole thing, the whole tome, and then took out the questions I was going to ask separately, so I didn't have to wrestle with a 50, 60 page document. Paragraph 40. Paragraph 40, thank you. Yes, it's paragraph 40, yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, fourth line down, third line down, actually. <coughs> so, what, what I would say in terms of the, in terms of having that local mandate and as local authorities we are the closest to the communities in terms of having a democratic mandate it is really important that authorities can actually fulfill their their rights within this i don't have I'm, I'm looking at it in terms of the human rights budgeting perspective i know that across local authorities there has been discussions with the communities and certainly i can speak on behalf of my own authority of dumfries and galloway where we actually went out to consult with the community because you know there's is difficult decisions that have to be made and where there are specific um, policies that you know, local government are responsible for delivering we do need to make sure that they're properly funded which would mean on occasions that we have to look at where we're not able to deliver policies because of difficult budget decisions that are being made I mean, from, from, from what we see from the resource spending review, you are only going to be faced with difficult decisions. I'm not aware of any easy decisions that are mm -hmm. going to be made. And so it, I think it's very difficult, frustrating when you get really... I mean, it's an excellent submission, but it, it's an excellent submission when you get growing uh, budgetary resource. It's not really a great submission when you've got a shrinking resource. And even where we ask what specific efficiencies can be made, you know, the submission says, well, if you give us additional resources, we can then make longer-term efficiencies which was the bit I was talking about in terms of deprioritisation earlier on. I mean, that's, that's really not where we are in terms of the finances at the moment because of inflation. So, for example, one of the things that you've said in your, in your submission, Mr Manning, is that the, 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 you know, the impact of the extraordinary effect of inflation should be recognised in the local government settlement. But how can that be done if the Scottish Government's own budget is, either redu is reducing in real terms? Okay, I, I mean, the, it's, it's a point that, that's well made, uh, and you, uh, understanding that our submission went in from a local authority point of, of view, and we are in a position where uh, inflation is making things absolutely 
critical right, across the next couple of years. I, I referred elsewhere in the document to a budget gap that we've got. Yeah, 37 million. Which is 37 yeah. million pounds. Now, that's, that's probably doubled. Mm -hmm. Right, sorry. And getting to the 37 million pounds is probably doubled by... S sorry, so just to interrupt you there. Can you put that in perspective in terms of the overall budget of South Lanarkshire? Okay, you, you are talking about a budget of 700, right? Plus million. Pounds, so, so it could right? be as much as ten percent of the budget. Well, it's not quite getting on for. It's probably closer to around five percent of the budget. Yeah, but you're, you said it could be seventy, or it could be doubled. Right. Sorry. Right. And getting to, I've not been clear. Right. Seeing right. getting to the thirty-seven million oh, pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, I'd have been looking at a budget gap of around half of that. Right. So you're right. talking so about five percent gap. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Right. That's so fine. I wasn't clear there. That's my sure. fault. Where. Uh, there are there are things that we're faced with every year in trying to put together the budget, right? So I, I would need to provide money for pay award. We had assumed right a, a modest decrease in our grant. Uh, we had we, we would look to provide for things like contract inflation and in putting together our budget. So normally I would have been looking at things items like that, adding twenty million pounds to our bill, right? There are exceptional pressures as we get into 2023-24. Uh, so, for example, utilities. Right? I believe we'll need to put an extra eight million pounds into the budget next year uh, for for things like fuel. Easily an extra another two million pounds. I could add another million pounds onto that for pupil transport. A real concern is PPP payments. Right, so we've got, as do most other councils, PPP schools, the contracts have got an inflationary uplift. Right, so that crystallises at the beginning of next year. Right, and uh, when, it, when I wrote that paper, there was an estimate of inflation being somewhere 10, 11 per cent round about February next year mm. when those contract payments crystallise. So, so that would be another four million pounds. Right on onto that budget gap. The point I'm making is that the inflationary the inflationary climate makes this extra strained right, in comparison to another year. So normally I might have been looking at a budget gap of somewhere just under twenty million pounds, right? But it's up into the mid thirties because of these inflationary pressures. And there's no way around them. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and believe me, I've, I've tried around things like PPP, but I, I, I can't see a way out of this. So it's that that makes this particularly acute. Okay, I mean, one of the things that you've suggested, and indeed is in the main causeless submission, is the, the multi-year settlements. And I think around this table, I think we're all really sympathetic and supportive of that for local government. Of course, the issue, of course, is that Scottish, the Scottish Parliament <laughs> doesn't really have multi-year settlements, which makes it difficult um, for ourselves, especially given the... the, the, the proportion of resource that goes to local government. So uh, when the Accounts Commission give evidence, they always talk, and I had a meeting with them privately just a, a week or so ago, two weeks ago actually, um, they talk about long-term planning uh, and that most local authorities, but not all, are involved in medium to long-term planning. So what work is going on, um, uh, uh, Katie, in terms of, uh, for COSLA, in terms of long-term planning, uh, fin financial planning? So I think, I mean, you're absolutely correct. You know, we would all very much want to be working on multi-year settlements, and that's the ambition that COSLA, that's the position that COSLA wants to, to get to. I think, you know, touching on the, the point raised previously, and I welcome the invitation, you know, as the new spokesperson for resources within COSLA, about that deliberative engagement that's you know, come forward once again. I know it was touched upon with my predecessor um, in this role. And certainly, you know, it is about where Scottish Government has priorities that local government are looking to take forward. We need to have those engagements, those discussions, and be part of the, the conversation so we can then take forward that aspiration of how do we get, even if we don't have that multi-year settlement, how do we get to that ambition of where we want to get to and how can we get there together? So, you know, it's, it is an aspiration that we want to get that, but, you know, I absolutely accept Scottish Government are working within the confines and the constraints that they are with the budgets that you're given. So, you know, it's how do we, 
how do we plan on that? And it's, it's about being around the table and being part of those discussions so we can actually find a way forward in a positive direction. OK, I'm going to let colleagues in a couple of minutes. I'm just going to ask couple, two more questions. One is to yourself, Kirsty. Um, you've, in the submission, you said there, there should be a greater emphasis on tracking outcomes rather than spend. But should it not be both? I think there's been, with a, with a number of new uh, new policy commitments, there is an increased uh, reporting requirement uh, to report how much has been spent, uh, whereas I think the focus should be on delivering the outcomes. So, you know, rather than focusing purely on inputs and outputs, uh, we should be focus focusing on the outcomes more. OK, thanks. And, 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 um, and, and Paul, um, you, you talked about digitalisation in your submission and, you, uh, and the potential savings to South Lanarkshire, uh, but you also said the Scottish Government would help, would need, might need to help with implementation costs, which of course again is another additional cost for the Scottish Government. So what kind of additional assistance would South Lanarkshire need and what kind of savings would we be talking about through digitalisation, either over one year or five years, whatever time period you would be assessing? Coming back to our response, I think part of the point that's being made there is around common platforms, right? And rather yeah. than, than having, or rather than trying uh, to replicate the same system multiple times within different councils, there would obviously be, if it could be done once, right, or if we could at least rationalise how we, we come up with digital solutions, right, from a procurement point of view and from a service delivery point of view, that would help greatly. But you know, ha having been through this on a number of occasions, right, sometimes it's difficult to synchronise changes like that within council. So it, it's, you, know, you, you might be ready to implement a new system, but another local authority, for example, uh, has just put in a system two years ago and they did not get the appetite to make that change. So how can I put it? Investment in to create common platforms and common solutions might be a way to, to break that cycle right, of limping along and never really biting the bullet in terms of having common digital platforms. So I haven't quantified and I, I can't quantify here what that would be across Scotland. Right? But I think there is an acknowledgement in our submission and there's an acknowledgement across local government that, yeah, uh, that there are real gains to be made from digitising what we do. There will always be people who don't want to or who can't right, in, engage with you in, in getting service or getting access to information digitally. But there's a, you know, th there is a, a growing percent, right, and it's a much grown percent within the past 10 years who are prepared to do that. Right? So, you, you know, how can I put it? Our submission in that context was meant to be positive, given a suggestion is to, is to if, you know, if we were to try and use that as a theme to make a change, that would be a good one to start with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to open out the session to colleagues around the, uh, the table and uh, first to ask a question will be Ross to be followed by John. Thanks, Convener. Um, looking back a couple of weeks, COSLA's position in the, the recent local government pay dispute was that the Scottish Government needed to contribute more money for that to be resolved, and eventually that was the case. So two weeks ago, the Deputy First Minister published the uh, budget revision explaining where that money had come from. Do you think that money was taken from the, the right places to fund the, to settle the pay dispute? I'm happy to come in. Thank you, um, Mr. Greer, for your for your questions. I think, in terms of local government, the in, and looking at the pay dispute, I think what local authorities and across the leaders had mandated that two percent was the maximum that local authorities could provide in that pay dispute, and we did receive reoccurring funding from Scottish Government of £140 million, which was absolutely welcomed, and the fact that it was reoccurring enabled us to increase that offer. Obviously, there was intervention by the First Minister, and that is now, you know, put, put the strike action on hold, and that has now gone out to unions, and we will await the outcome. There's going to be further discussion in terms of teachers' pay, and that's going to be ongoing. So, you know, it has been a really, really challenging situation, and, you know, yes, ultimately, 
there is not an infinite amount of money. But, you know, with all respect, it's, local government is not there to determine what Scottish government should put their money into, so to speak. So, you know, we want to, nobody wants to be in a position where they're not paying their employees or their employ yeah, their employees a fair and reasonable wage. You know, local government is one of the largest employers across Scotland, if not the largest. And you know, we want we value our staff, we value the input from the unions and we wanted to get to a position. So it there was no easy solution with this. And, you know, unfortunately, we're not quite out of the woods yet. We need to make sure that, you know, the pay settlement is, is fully resolved, but it's an ongoing process. So I guess my long, long answer to a short answer is, you know, I don't know at this point. It would be up to Scottish Government to determine what the priorities are. And some of those decisions are political. And, you know, that is the very nature of, of where we're at. And, you know, with limited budgets, these are, you know, these situations, these conversations are going to probably keep reoccurring. Thanks, and I agree absolutely. Given the, the context, it was about picking least worst options. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to check, they'll get the, the list that the Deputy First Minister published a fortnight ago. There was nothing on that list that it created concern for cause of, of knock-on effects to services that, that you deliver. So in, in regards to that, it... it there was a range of options, and I, I understand that you know COSLA officials are still working with government officials right. on flexibilities in order for us to be able to deliver that, and that's for this year alone. You know, ultimately there are going to be difficult decisions that have to be made. Thanks, um, and your written submission, I agree very much with the convener on the quality of this submission. Um, it mentions um, increased revenue raising powers for, for local government, which has obviously been a, a long running um, and an obvious point of concern for COSA. A few years ago, the workplace uh, parking levy was introduced through legislation. The programme for government a fortnight ago confirmed that the transient visitor levy will be introduced in, in this coming parliamentary year. Um, the visitor levy in particular has been a, a priority for COSA. So What's next? Now, now that you've, you've succeeded on this, visitor levy is, is going to be passed into to law, that power will go to local government. What's the next revenue raising lever that COSA would like to see given to local government? I think I'd, what I'd probably do is pass over to Kirsty potentially on this one. I mean, obviously, we need to have these discussions throughout the thematic boards of COSLOVE and then going to leaders so that there is that, that direction put in place. But I'll maybe pass over to Kirsty as, as Chair of SIPFA in terms of those specifics. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if I have all the answers on, on what the next uh, revenue raising uh, options are. I've not been involved in the discussions, but I know there has been discussions uh, on council tax. And I very much welcome the, the transient visitor, visitor levy and that, that that for some councils might see a significant amount of money uh, coming in. Uh, but as Paul mentioned earlier, with the cost of inflation, you know, it's probably going to get uh, wiped out with the cost of inflation just now. But it's certainly something that, uh, that, that we would welcome. And we'll obviously have to consult with our communities on that. We mentioned earlier the, the, the planning fees and building control. And again, that would be something that if we uh, have control of that in local government, and we could obtain full cost recovery. That would be uh, that would be welcome too. Thanks very much. Um, just moving on to a different area. This may sound more confrontational than I uh, mean it to, but um, councils across Scotland, I accept that this is very significantly from authority to authority. But collectively, the 32 councils have. Um, far more in, in their reserve than the Scottish Government is even legally allowed to have in its reserve at any one time, never mind what it's got at the moment. Some of the acute costs uh, that councils are facing at the moment, so Paul, you mentioned energy costs over the, the coming months for, for council facilities. Are they the kind of areas where, if a council is in the position where it has reserves, it can use the reserves to pay the increased energy costs, accepting that that is a short-term, not a, a long-term solution. I'm interested to know how, how councils are planning on using reserves where they have them. Listen, I'm, I'm happy to come in on that one. Uh, I, I, I can't speak for all councils. I, I, I can give you an answer in terms of my own. Part of the money that we have in reserves will be paying in the current year those increased energy costs. Uh, the, the vast majority, if not all councils, will be in this position. 
their reserves will be earmarked for specific things. And more often than not, their reserves will be earmarked to make the, the financial position, the budget position, deliverable over the short to medium term. Right, that, that there is not money salted away within councils that's going to see us even into the, you know, the, the, the sort of five-year term yeah. in terms of a balanced budget position. So in the case of my own authority, the, uh, the reserves that we've got are supporting our revenue budget in the short to medium term. It will do that for, for maybe two years, and in the third year, we will face a, a much higher savings target than I will over the next two. We can keep things moderate, and deliverable for a period of two years, right? Uh, but, in, but in the third year, we'll start to look at a cliff face in terms of an efficiency savings uh, target, and most authorities are going to be in the same position. So th th there, th there is a picture painted of local authority reserves, right? Most of it will be bolstering the financial position in the short to, to you know, short medium term. Other things within local authority reserves will be for things like housing revenue accounts, uh, insurance funds. They've got specific purposes. For most councils, and I include my own, there is a very uh, small amount of money comparatively. In, in comparison to the council's budget, it's 1.5%, right, which is our uncommitted reserve. Now, that's our, in case of emergency, smash glass money. Right? But, but that is small, and if I was to use that to deal with budget pressures in the immediate term, I, I would be having a conversation with the Auditor-General pretty quickly after that about what my approach is going to be in order to replenish those reserves. So, you know, looking to reserves is really short term, and it's not something that uh, councils are in a position to do. Hey, Ross. Thanks. Kirsty. I think Kirsty's still on mute. Oh, no, there we go. You yes, come in thank, here. Th thanks very much. I probably had I'd asked to speak uh, just when, when Paul started speaking, and I'll probably just uh, reiterate some of the points that, that, that Paul made. I think quite a lot of authorities are probably going to have to use reserves in the current financial year, 22-23, and some of that is probably reserves they've had left over uh, from COVID uh, to support their uh, inflation rises. But for a lot of councils, they're seeing the reserves being depleted eh, for next year, and therefore the cost of inflation is very much an additional cost eh, eh, next year. Also, there's, there's probably quite a lot of people's reserves that have been set aside to support capital investment, and that will be crucial eh, to support economic regeneration and recovery eh, from COVID. And that's, you know, our capital grant has remained static for a number of years now, and uh, or, or it has reduced actually, but it's going to remain static uh, over the next few years. And therefore, some of the reserves that are set aside are really crucial to support that uh, capital investment in uh, council areas. Thanks much. That's all from me, Camina. Yeah, I, I should point out the Scottish Government's uh, capital allocation was cut by 9.8% in the current financial year. So um, I understand the position you're in. It's the position the whole Parliament's in. OK, um, John, to be followed by Douglas. Hey, thanks very much, convener. Um, what, what, one of the issues you raise uh, is about preventative spend, and, and that's something this committee has done quite a lot of work on, and I think we're all sympathetic, but struggle with the idea of how we put it into practice, because if we don't have any extra money at the moment, and I, I take the point that uh, it's paragraph, I think, seven in your report, um, you know, education, housing, employment are, are key things which can prevent then reduced demand on, say, the NHS or, or other more reactive services. But, I mean, do you have any suggestions as to how we balance that? Because, you know, the, we, we get continually shown what, what are the waiting times for A&E at hospitals, and, and that's a big figure, and we all get excited about it. But, in a sense, if we put more money into that, there's less money for housing or whatever. Uh, have you got any suggestions how we get that balance right? So, so again, I've, I would say that it's maybe not for COSLA to say what government should be doing or putting that funding in. However, one of the points that I did want to raise is, and it was in the Public Health Scotland submission to this committee, 
And it's a quote, if I can read out, that the NHS was never designed to work alone in protecting our health and well-being, and all public services have a role to play in creating the building blocks of health. So the fact that that's come from Public Health Scotland and not John Cosler actually just reinforces this holistic whole system approach of actually, you know, of course we want to increase the, the more positive outcomes of health, but it's not just as simple as looking at that end point. We need to look at the whole system. And it is, it, you know, it's, I, I feel like I'll be repeating this often, but it, it is challenging mm -hmm. and it is going to be difficult. And that's where we need to have these open discussions of how we work in partnership together to get to that good point of where we can deliver and increase those health outcomes for everybody, for all our communities. Mm -hmm. No, and I don't think you'll find MD here, no. certainly not myself, who's going to argue with that. Yeah. The point's been made, and I think it's made in this paper, that you know we've, we've tended to give the NHS more than inflation or, or a, at least a bigger increase than we've given to local government. And the two of them are the main two parts of our budget. And I've asked your predecessor this, so I might as well ask you as well. Um, you know, have we been too generous to the NHS? Should we be trying to kind of give the same increase to both the NHS and local government? I think the, the standard answer to that is I would never look to take away or I'd never say that you know, NHS shouldn't have funding. Absolutely not. We, we want to have those outcomes. You know, we, we need to invest across, but what we need to ensure that is local government, that when we're delivering on some of these key priorities and we'll be, you know, in effect, mopping up some of the maybe the unseen consequences that we need to be properly and financially resourced so that we can actually do that job properly. But it's not to say that, you know, local government should get money over the NHS, you know, but again, it, it's difficult choices for government to make. I mean, another choice we have to make is this question of a uh, ring fencing and do, do we, should we just give more money to local government or any other sector for that matter um, and then we get accused immediately of oh there's a postcode lottery because Aberdeen's spending more on education whereas South Lanarkshire is spending more on social care or refuse mm -hmm. or something. Um, have you any suggestions how we get round that balance? So what I would say is I it's about, and I'll go back to the term used previously, that deliberative engagement. Let's have that discussion. Let's work in partnership together. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that there is that level of direct to spend, and that has significantly increased. It's sitting approximately at 65% of the council budgets at present, which is a, it's a huge portion, which leaves less money for us to deliver the, the core, the other core aspects that we are delivering as local authorities. But uh, again, I'll maybe bring Kirsty in as, as Chair of SIPFA, who's maybe got more technical detail on that. But, you know, 65% of direct spend is a, is a large proportion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I would say, and, you know, speaking from my, my own local authority, where we do work in a very collaborative way, is we all agree on you know ninety five percent of the priorities. Nobody's sitting here saying that we shouldn't be delivering you know the, for the very best outcomes. And it it does come down to that level of trust and you know giving that that power back into the local communities and delivering through local government. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll come to Ms. Fadigan in just a minute. If, but if I can press, I mean, there's a kind of political angle as well as the technical angle, isn't there? Because if you're sitting in South Lanarkshire and across the road is North Lanarkshire and they're doing something differently, you and your colleagues come under pressure. Sorry, you're not like you're Dumfries and Galloway's, but, but wh whichever one it is, mm -hmm. it, your council comes under pressure. Oh, well, the next council is doing so much more. They're collecting the bins mm -hmm. more often and all that kind of thing. So do you feel under pressure to be consistent with other councils? I think each local authority is so unique and different that it, each local authority is delivering for the best way for their communities. I, I mean, it, you, you mentioned yourself from a political point of view, if the local authority isn't delivering for the community as they best see fit, then we will have a, a, a new election and, you know, a new... A new council will be elected, so you know it, we have got that dem, that democratic mandate, and it's up to individual councillors to take that forward. 
and you know, ultimately the power lies within our communities, within our people who are electing the councils. But as I say, it is it is very challenging. You know, as you pointed out, as I've said, Dumfries and Galloway um, local authority is very different from, say, one of the you know, say, let's say, Stirling you know, council or or Edinburgh. And what works for one local authority may not necessarily work for a second. So you know, it has to be done on almost that individual basis and with the expertise that local authorities have that, as I say, it, it does come down to that trust and knowledge that your know, local government is best placed to deliver for the local priorities. OK, thanks. Ms Flanagan, did you want to come in? Yeah, I, I guess maybe I would add that, you know, some local authorities they are already delivering different services. So sometimes when we get the ring fencing of uh, some monies, uh, you know, some authorities might be all already delivering on that outcome that the ring fence monies are, are for. So we're all at different stages of what we're actually delivering, dependent on what the needs are for our own communities. So, uh, you know, I think there's an element of trust, uh, trusting local authorities that, that the money that is passed over uh, will be delivered on the, the, the key outcomes and, and, remove that, and remove that ring fencing. You know, communities have very different needs. And, uh, you know, if looking at your example, you know, between South Lanarkshire and North Lanarkshire, if they are delivered differently, there is probably services that are delivered differently, but they are probably delivering on the same outcomes for that community. OK, thanks. Well, wh while you are speaking, maybe I could uh, come back to an issue you mentioned already, which was like uh, planning and uh, building control, f kind of full cost recovery. Can you explain to us in a bit more detail you know, are councils not recovering their full costs, or are some recovering and some aren't? Or quite, how does that whole system work? I'm not, I'm not sure ac across uh, Scotland what the position is, uh, but the, the fees are the fees are set nationally, and if we had the ability to to set our, our own fees locally, we could structure them uh, so that we ensure that we do get full cost recovery. Right. So, um, so not entirely sure. I mean, if it was possible to give us to get some of that information, because I would be concerned if all, none of the councils say were uh, recovering their costs. I mean, I certainly get developers who say they'd be happy to pay more if it if it meant yeah. speedier planning decisions. I, th I think I think we could get that information for you and okay. provide that to the committee if that would be helpful. Well, I think it would be to to, to me. So, thanks uh, okay. very very much. Um, I mean, another point. That's one of these balances that we've been discussing so much uh, is towards the end of the uh, COSLA submission. It, there's the mention of transparency, and the submission brings in the question of flexibility as well. And I just wonder again how we get the balance right between these two. Um, Mr. Manning, sorry, I haven't asked you any questions, so maybe I should try asking you this one. Um, because if we just give money, in one sense, ring fencing's easy. I'm not saying I totally agree with ring fencing, but then we can follow where it's gone, because we get questions asked in here about how much is spent in education and so on. Whereas if we give South Lanarkshire an extra amount of money eh, and then it gets split up in different ways, does that actually, although that's flexible, does that reduce the transparency in some ways? Well, I, 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 again, I, I'm making reference to causeless submission, right? But, you know, there, there were certain aspects that were picked up in our own. I would go back to the point that Councillor Hagman made and Kirsty made as well. There is a degree of this which is about respecting local government's position in the democratic process and trusting the decisions that are made locally. I think that's an important thing. Picking up on, on your point, uh, Mr Mason, around flexibility and transparency. So flexibility and, and, you know, and how local government uses the, the money given to it would, would help Right, and it would help, particularly in dealing with the type of problems that we've uh, we've discussed this afternoon and that I've discussed this afternoon. So, if local authorities were trusted to come up with a solution that suits their local needs, right, in a way that's democratically approved by their local members, that might lead to a different spend in some areas than in others. Right, so it's about getting those bonds loosened right, at a local level to, to get trust made that, or, or trust in the process that the right decision is going to be taken for a particular area, right, which would hopefully be positive 
in terms of the outcomes in that area. So we've, we've, we've talked at length about the proportion which is directed and which, which isn't directed, and Councillor Hadman's made the point that it actually boils down to, to, to maybe you know two thirds close on being directed. So, so that's the, the extent of the change that could be made through this. The point around transparency is really one that, that's probably at a, a, a level of, of you know, local government as a whole and, and even the Scottish Parliament looking at what is actually the, the local government spend. Right? Because it comes from different departmental uh, budgets within the overall Scottish budget. It's not necessarily easy to follow what follows through the local government, so that impedes transparency. And what it makes it particularly difficult to get to is, well, what's our core funding? And that's the point that, that gets made by local government every year, right? And, and it is the core of what we do. If, if we put to the side the specific government initiatives that we're getting funded for and money that comes in from other departmental budgets, it is, you know, to, to what extent is that core funding uh, suffering? Also, if... if you, you know, that doesn't uh, guide us towards a strategic approach to looking at the, the local government budget, right? To, you know, to, to having that clear picture of what it is and how we see it moving across the, the, the across the sort of short to medium term. So that, that's the issue that I think we were picking out in the point around transparency. Okay. Right. We, could, we could probably spend longer on that, but I think I'll be running out of time soon. So if I could just ask one more question, I'll try yourself on that as well. It, in the COSLA submission under capital projects and expenditure, it talks about 30% increase on anticipated costs, which I have to say jumped out at me. Is that the kind of inflation we're talking about for what, capital projects and, and so on? It, it wouldn't surprise me. Right? So I, I could pick an example of a, a bridge right, which we've been trying to construct Right, within our own authorities area. The purpose of the bridge is really to connect uh, a, a community who, who at the moment have to go on a, a terrible dog-leg journey right, because the, the existing bridge uh, isn't safe anymore. So this was you know, costed properly right, and thoroughly a couple of years ago right, at around £4 million. We could be looking at a cost increase not too different to the one that we're, we're talking about there in terms of a percentage increase. And there's a whole number of reasons for that. Right? The inflation that we've talked about, particularly a, a, you know, in the case of capital projects, and it's a, it's a statement of the obvious, right? construction industry inflation is running at a higher level. Inflation on commodities that are commonly used in capital projects, so for example, steel, and this is an issue that hasn't been helped Right, by the, the war in Ukraine, which was a steel supplier right, to, to, to the UK. That has forced the cost of these things up. And what we, we are seeing are longer lead-in times to capital projects that makes it, makes it harder to deliver. And we're also seeing fewer companies being prepared to bid for public sector contracts at the moment because they know, you know by the nature of what we do, we are going to try and price these keenly. Right, and they're not as attractive a proposition to the market as they might once have been. So that, that's, that's not fantasy. That's the reality of what councils are having to live with at the moment. Okay, well, leave it at that just now. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much, Douglas. And followed by Daniel. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, when I was a, a councillor and went along to the, um, uh, the, you know, the COSLA leaders' meetings, you know, when, we, when the tourist tax was discussed, it was always spoken about as uh, optional for each local authorities. And also, additionality was another key thing. But have we now moved to a place where councils are looking at things like the tourist tax or the parking taxes, not as additional income, but to plug the gaps that they, they have? Um, I can come in on that one. I mean, I, as, I, as I've said before, each local authority is different. And you know, local authorities are at a position that they have to look and, and make these hard decisions as well. So while you know, some local authorities may not be wishing to put those taxes in place, they, there are options available for them. And it comes back down to those choices, those flexibilities. And for what works for one may not, but there should never be that 
a portion of blame that, oh, look, this local authority is doing, is making this tax and it's not as good as this, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's where we need to get to, to be able to actually have that understanding that we have to have that individual level for each local authority. But, but have you got members that are looking at the tourist tax as a way to, you know, increase spend on tourism, for example, or, or marketing, or are they looking at it now to, to plug the, the gaps that they've got? What I would say is in terms of, of local government finance, I think all local authorities are looking at ways of increasing revenue in order to provide some of that those core um, provisions that local government mm -hmm. provides. But, so is that to provide additionality or is it to just basically to keep the lights on and to provide the statutory services that you, the councils have to provide? So where we are is, you know, we are looking at a 7% real terms cut to local authority ah. budgets. So Yes, you know, local authorities are having to find ways to, to fill to those fill gaps. Gap. Okay. Uh, Kirsty, do you have anything to add on that? Or? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, with the, with the cuts that the, the local government is faced with just now, we're obviously going to have to make some difficult decisions on services that, that uh, you know, are important to tourism, you know, waste services, roads and infrastructure. So, you know, it will probably fill a gap for services that we would no longer be able to afford in the way we've afforded them in the past, and that tourism tax it will, will help to plug that gap. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next thing I was going to go on to, because I know we're short of time, um, in your submission you talk about the, you know, the gap going forward over the next five years and the equivalent of 20,000 fewer local government jobs. So do you think that's a reality that we're looking at in five years' time, that there'll be 20,000 fewer local government jobs? Kate? So ultimately, local government is probably going to have to adapt and evolve. And certainly one of the discussions that we have when we were looking at the pay increase is in order to put a larger pay settlement forward, if local government, if we hadn't had that reoccurring funding um, from Scottish government in order to meet that pay gap, then we were faced with the reality that yes, local government would be looking at cuts to jobs. That is the reality mm. that is faced by local government right so, now. So is local government still looking at 20,000 fewer jobs in the next five years? So that would be dependent on the budgets coming forward. But yes, with the predicted decreasing mm -hmm. in budget allocation, then local government will have to make those difficult yeah. decisions. Paul, did you want to come in? Or? I, I think it, I mean, it, it, it's fair to say you've got within the COSLA submission a, a picture of budget gaps moving forward. So I've quoted today in the case of my own council, £37 million. Pounds. I, I suppose we just need to remember the majority of what councils spend is employee costs. So if budget gaps have to be closed, that, that is absolutely something that councils are going to be, you know, having to consider, right, are there levels of staffing moving forward? And the, the things that, that for, I, for example, we quoted in our submission around, you know, the uh, capacity within things like digital transformation, right, you, you know, that will take a uh, cost, right, out of processes. And sometimes that means taking jobs out of processes and, and that section of our response was meant to be constructive in terms of what are the areas that you're going to look to in, in, in trying to bridge that, that budget gap moving forward. But in, in, you know, I, I don't think we should be under any illusion. Right? These are very real gaps that are faced by a local government. And unless there are solutions put in place, right, and you know, we, we've talked about the ideal solution being more funding or funding that addresses the inflationary pressures that we're facing, then there are going to be uh, losses and jobs in local government. Mm -hmm. And I guess from that, unless there's digitisation quick to replace people, then there's going to be an impact on services that local government provide. And, and, and I, you know, I was in earlier on when the Auditor General was here, and I think it was a point that's been made a number of times. Change takes time. Mm -hmm. right? And an you know, and, and ability to, to innovate, to digitise processes, to change structures, right? to implement any change in structure. You know, it's not going to be done for year 2023-24. Right? And you know, councils will, will be taking that into account in their approach moving forward. But in order to make change, I do think you need two things. One's time, right, and one's investment, 
mm -hmm. right? So some degree of money put in there to facilitate change. And I gave the, the example earlier on of, of digitisation of processes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the examples that I think the government gave about, you know, how you could reform is digitisation, maximising revenue through public sector innovation, reform a public sector estate, reform a public, you know, public body landscape, improving public procurement. Is this not things you've, you've already been doing for the last five years? I, 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 again, right, you know, councils have a... If, if we were coming at this from a position where councils hadn't spent the past decade making efficiencies mm -hmm. and, and you were looking at a clean slate and looking at what they do and thinking, OK, there, there's things that can be done here in order to make this a better position, you know, I'd feel better about that, but it's not, right? So we're, we're, we're going back to councils and we're, we're you know, we're saying we're going back to councils through the position that we're in in terms of a funding settlement that's there is flat cash right and the inflationary climate that we're in doing things through becoming more efficient uh, it's going to be that bit more difficult because you know the low-hanging fruit has been taken long ago so the, the the ideas that are referenced in there are absolutely ones that are worth looking at and you mentioned there at the end that the in terms of the public sector estate, and there are considerations there, and that's a prime example of one where investments needed, right, and trying to meet net zero commitments, right. So there, there will be a, a massive cost in that moving forward, right. So the, the, these are areas that have been looked at. There is merit in looking at them further, and I think we reflected that in our own response. But somewhere along the line, right, as, as well as structural change, right, and as well as becoming more efficient. Councils are going to be in a position where they have to look at the services that are provided right, with a view to, to trying to cut back in them in order to bridge budget gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirsty, I was going to ask you next, you, you spoke earlier about early intervention and prevention. I completely agree that you know, more money spent at a local level probably means less money eventually spent on health, health spent on justice. And, yeah, and, but it's how, how do you make the case better then to Scottish Government, how do you quantify what you can save later on to, to, to the health budget, the justice budget? I think that's, that's a really difficult question and I'm not sure if I, I could quantify that, but I guess if we look at the, 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 the outcomes just now, we're not delivering on all the outcomes that a uh, Scottish Government uh, want to uh, deliver on. Uh, so. So there needs to be a change in what we're, we're currently doing. I just wanted to also, I'd, I'd asked to kind of speak earlier, I wanted to just to pick up that your, your question on a, uh, your question on jobs cuts. I think that's a real, uh, a, a real uh, likely scenario because 60 to 70 percent of our budget uh, also is on the workforce. And Councillor Hagman uh, noted the additional money that we'd got for uh, the, the pay, the pay settlement. And that's that, that's very much welcomed. But I have to point out that councils also are short eh, for the pay settlement. Most councils are budgeted two percent for pay, and the, the additional money that the deputy, deputy first minister has awarded is, 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 is takes that up to three and a half percent, and the, the pay. Uh, the pay award offer is currently 5%, so councils have a 1.5% gap that they need to bridge in pay, and to do that, we'll probably see significant job losses. So, so even just to meet the pay settlement that was agreed this year, there's got to be savings made elsewhere. Is that what you're, you're saying? Yeah, uh, in, the, in the current year, most councils have budgeted for a 2% pay award in the current year. You know, the 5% pay award that's on the table leaves uh, councils in the current year uh, with a budget gap that they're going to have to look at. And the Deputy First Minister has confirmed that he's, he's willing to look at some flexibilities on the, some of the funding, the ring fence funding that has been looked at. But we're just in the early stages of discussion on that just now. So, yes, moving on to next year, there's going to be significant budget gaps, but most councils are going to have uh, a, a budget gap in the current year because of the pay award offer. Because it wasn't fully funded by the Scottish Government, I guess. That's correct. Most councils have 2 per cent uh, in their budget for that. And, uh, and uh, uh, Deputy First Minister's funding equates to around about 1.5 per cent. So there's a 1.5 per cent gap. Okay. 
Thank you. And, and sorry, back to the point about early intervention, Kirsty. You know, how, how do we get the message across better to the government that more money spent on local government will give that savings later? Is there a way of quantifying it at all, do you think? Not quite sure, actually, how to how to get that message across better. Mm -hmm. It's it's a message that we have been uh, that we've been uh, reiterating uh, for a number of years. But yeah, I'd need to think about that further. Okay, thank you, thank you, Convener. OK, thank you very much. And I would say the issue of um, the, the, the transient visitor levy, or tourist tax, as it's called, is it might be good news for a guile and beauty, but I can't see North Lanarkshire making much out of it. So I think there's a real issue about uh, the fact that it's going to be very uneven in terms of which local authorities benefit from and which don't. And that would also have to, I think, be taken into consideration with funding deliberations. Uh, Daniel, to be followed by Michelle. I'll, I'll keep... This to, to one question, but I'll, I'll just I'll put two strands to it. In uh, COSA's submission, it, it states that in real terms since 2013, uh, the, the local government budgets have been cut by 7%. Indeed, Mr Manning was pointing out that within that, that uh, the, the, the uh, two-thirds has, uh, has gone to ring-fenced areas. But further on in the submission, it, it says that... that, that, that um, those ring fencing stairs have to be cross-subsidised from your discretionary budget. That, that, is that implying that that 15% real terms cut, to, to, it, 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 there's an additional sum to come out of it? Uh, in that, if you've got, if you're, if you've got ring fenced, uh, 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 that, that's impacting on, on, on core, and then you're having to cross-subsidise. And if so, is there, a, is there a, 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 a quantum that you can attach to that cross-subsidisation? Can I, can I start off with, with this one, right? So, a part, I think, of the point that's being made in COSLA's submission is there are areas of directed spend, right? So, there, there, there are additional monies coming in for specific purposes, right? And, and COSLA's submission goes into a, a fair amount of detail in terms of monies that have come for health and social care, children and young people. And uh, I think another example was it was around the £10.50 per hour. Right, th those are all quoted right, in, in COSLA's submission in terms of monies for specific uplifts. One of the points that I think is made in COSLA's submission is those initial amounts go in, right, but in an inflationary climate, right, councils are going to be faced with pressure on that spend. Right? So what you, what you had to spend on a unit of those services last year is, I understand is the worth, point. Right? I, 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 I'm just wondering if, 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 if you've actually quantified that. So I, I understand the point that you, your budgets are under pressure because of ring fencing. That, that's where you get from 7% to 15%. What you're implying in the submission is that on top of that, you're having to subsidise those ring fencing areas from your discretionary budget. I'm just asking, do you actually have a quantification of either what proportion of your budget or, or how does that... What, what, what is the addition to the 15% effective reduction? Right. I, I think individual councils could do that for individual uh, priorities and for initiatives that have been put in place. And between myself and Councillor Hagman, we're happy to have a conversation with the COSLA team to see if that figure is within the background papers of the COSLA submission. And that would be helpful. And likewise, you mean you've specifically quoted the, the, the early years funding. I mean, has that specific policy being funded in terms of how much that is having to be subsidised from core discretionary funding? I think if I can come in, I think in order to get clarity around that, I can get my local government finance team to submit some further written evidence direct to you in that specific issue. But what, what I would say is in terms of the, the, the key areas of, of policy, so child poverty, climate change, looking at you know, a fair, greener economy. Local government are key partners within that delivery. And this is you know, this very question of, is it properly funded? How do we ensure that we're not having to take? So by having that early intervention, that early discussion during the, the creation of those policies is, is the point that COSLA has been, has been making, that we need to be round the table and having those early discussions so that therefore when the funding is 
delivered and, and it is given to local authorities that it is a true reflection on the actual cost that it takes to deliver. Yeah, I mean, I understand that. I, I, this is, a, I think, a slightly different point in that you are saying that the, the ring-fenced areas of policy delivery are not being sufficiently funded. I was just really asking you to clarify by how much. So if you and can, if you can that provide in that in writing, that would be really helpful. Will do. Thank you. I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Daniel and Michelle to follow by Liz. Again, I'll try, I'll try and uh, be brief. I've just got a couple of questions. Uh, in your submission, you mentioned a uh, wider adoption of shared services, and you correctly note that it needs uh, increased resources and time to take effect. But the other area that it needs is appetite. So can you help me understand what of the standard functions that are normally part of shared services, i.e. finance, HR and IT, is there any genuine shared services across all 32 local councils? I think on the specifics of this one, I'll maybe pass over to Kirsty to, to answer no that as, as chair of SIPFA. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Paul might be able to help me out as well. I think the question of shared services is, is quite challenging. Uh, across all the authorities, certainly in our, our Gail and Butte Council, where I, I work, there's not a, there's not a great desire, uh, not, not from our council perspective, but for people to share services with our Gail and Butte Council. It is, is really quite difficult to share services across uh, what would be such a, a, wide, a wide geography. Uh, our own council is a huge geography, as it is, never mind. Sharing, uh, sharing across, so it makes it really hard to, whilst, whilst we, we would like to do shared services, it's not always practical to do that. Uh, and, and, there may, and, you know, I, I think coming from our Gail and Butte Council, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not kind of aware on all the, the services that our councils are sharing, so whether, whether Paul can give any examples from a central belt area uh, that, that could help. Okay, yeah. I can't, I, right, Everybody's I, looking at you, Paul. <laughs> I, I can't readily okay. give an example. Right? I, again, through COSLA, right, we'll, we'll hopefully try and properly document the instances that are, that are yeah. there. I, one of the points that I was making earlier is uh, just uh, the changes that are likely to come right, if and when we go to a national care service are going to bring this to the fore again. And I've seen right. the recent document that was uh, published in May. So uh, going back to your point, Kirsty, I'm not talking, I mean, sometimes you could see facilities management, for example, being part of a shared services uh, function. I accept what you're saying about the disparate geography of Argyll and Butte, but uh, you're also pointing out to me that there is a lack of appetite uh, across councils where you have replicated functions FDs, for example, IT, for example, HR, the specialisms, in any other commercial walk of life where I spent some time in a previous life, there's no way that you would have duplicated a functions across the board. So that hence my comment about appetite, uh, you know, because on the one hand, councils are complaining about not having any money. On the other hand, this to me is an area that clearly should be looked at because they're duplicated functions across 32 councils. So I suppose that's the point I'm trying to make whilst accepting there's a time thing and there's a cost. Just one other question uh, yourself, Kirsty, I wanted to ask. It's a wee bit of a technical one, so hopefully we can deal with it quite quickly. You make the point about capital uh, accounting in the submission, and I know this has been rumbling about uh, for, for some time, but the, the review uh, that is planned to be underway. I mean, there's obviously some concerns about that, but I wondered what, what was the driver for a concern? Because this has been raised a number of times. Now something's been done about it and it's been looked. And surely, actually, a potential outcome is that it could be positive. So it's just to understand where your current concerns are coming from and the assumption that actually could end up less favourable for councils. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a great deal of concern about the, the capital accounting review. So local authorities are, are, are not comparable to, to profit-generating businesses where assets are, are purchased uh, to support profit-making activities. 
and then they get depreciated uh, to reduce the taxation uh, payable by that business over the life of, that, of the asset. We, we hold assets to deliver services to communities for, for the public good. So, you know, we put a notional charge through uh, our accounting, and if we had to, and, and we've got statutory mitigation in place that allows us mm -hmm. to do that, if we didn't have that statutory mitigation in place, the chances are that the charge that would be uh, put to our, to our council taxpayers or our rent payers in case of the HRA uh, would be uh, significantly higher. And, that I, and I understand that, that, but I'm trying to, sorry to interrupt, but I'm just trying to understand what is the basis for your concern that this might change. Surely there could be a potential for a positive outcome as well, uh, because this has been triggered by, by uh, the lack of flexibilities, fiscal flexibilities you have, the overarching review. I just wasn't clear from your submission why you're concerned and what evidence you're offering to back up that concern. I mean, has there been anything in the, like, indicated by the government that that is an intended way to go? I'm just not clear about that. We're actually not sure what the positives are, and you know uh, we have heard we have heard comments that there would be positives in that. But from a director of finance point of view, we're not sure what the positives are. We only see that there'd be uh, direct charges and, and increasing charges to uh, council revenue, which would limit the amount of capital investment we could make in the future. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not going to labour the point because I know time. I'm just not clear why you think that is automatically going to happen, and that's all I was querying, uh, because... Because, because I, I, my understanding is that the, the review is to look at the removal of the statutory mitigation that's in place, and if that statutory mitigation is uh, removed, then there'll be a bigger charge to, to the, the Council of Revenue that, in the HRA. Why it is the case? So has there been a terms of reference for the review? Uh, that there has been a terms of reference that we've seen, uh, and I think the review is about to kick off in October, so we'll get more yeah. information, and obviously we'll be we'll be involved in the okay. review, which is welcome. That we'll have a we'll have a, a seat okay. on the, the group. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. I have one uh, question, uh, Miss Lanigan. It's just on the back of uh, Michelle Thompson's first question to you. Um, I know what you're saying about. The fact that some councils are not terribly keen about sharing services because they feel that dilutes their own uh, you know, uh, best interests in terms of delivering local services. But of the areas and the councils which have delivered shared services, has an audit been done of how much money has actually been saved um, by joint services? Because I think it would be quite helpful to know where there is good practice. And just as I say, Michelle Thompson asking... Um, for some information about that, and I think that would be very helpful to this committee. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have any of that uh, figures to hand just now, but that's something we could we, we could look to get to get for you. Thank I think you. there maybe is a an opportunity now uh, that councils may be able to look at sharing of some services on the back of on the back of COVID, because uh, certainly prior to COVID. Uh, when when everybody was working in offices, you know, there's certainly, you know, if I take my council for example, if we had if we had shared services with some uh, with, with another authority and it took a number of jobs out our area, uh, you know, that would have been a concern for our local economy. But now that more more and more people are working remotely and online, uh, there possibly will be an opportunity. Uh, to look at some of the back office functions uh, for sharing, and that's something we'll certainly be exploring as a council, and others may well be doing that as well. Uh, I think it would be very helpful if we did have that information. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to follow on to that, I mean, one way to kind of look at the potential cost is to look at this in reverse. So I was a councillor in 1995 when uh, uh, they abolished Strathclyde Region. So you went from one social work department in Strathclyde to 12, because each local authority suddenly had 12 directors of social work and 12 directors deputy directors and all the rest to it. So, I mean, if you look at the kind of costs of setting that up, it would be interesting to, to see um, what potential savings it would be in terms of sharing some of those services. If I may come in, I mean, one of the points, and we are talking, obviously, in, 
in terms of finance, but certainly looking at collaborative working, we do have education collaborative going on, and certainly within, again, my own local authority, it's not just about having that saving, it's about the sustainability of services that we do sometimes need to look at. And certainly, I know for some young people, the only opportunity for them to take specific subjects in terms of education, to make, because of the sustainability, because of reality, and you know, we do need to be very mindful of you know rural areas that we need to look at doing things in sometimes a different way. It might you know not always be possible to do things in the same way. And again, it's about having that discussion. But you know, I do know that there are some local authorities that are sharing services, for example, in planning even now. So, you know, local authorities are open to that because we are looking at ways to best deliver services for our communities. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's exhausted the questions from the committee. Uh, so, I shall wind up this session and just remind uh, colleagues that uh, we'll be back in our usual Tuesday morning slot next week. We will continue to take further evidence on Scotland's public finances in 23-24. So, thank you all for your participation this afternoon. Thank you to all three of our witnesses.